airport or concerned that she might have to evacuate her home. So I thought that was a really good reason not to come to the board meeting. So we do have a quorum. So um, why don't we have a, a call to order? We'll go ahead and just take roll. Uh, Mr. Moradomi. Here. Dr. Kawaguchi. Here. Sid Brandvine. Not here. Dr. Turetsky. Here. Dr. Chala is not here. Ms. Garcia. Here. Deborah McIntyre here. Maria Salazar Sperber. Not here. Dr. Wong. Uh, here. And Ms. Michelin. Not here. So we have a quorum. Uh, moving on to item two. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, public comment for items not on the agenda. Um, if there are any members of the public that would like to comment on items not on the agenda, this is the time to do it. Seeing no volunteers. Uh, Mr. President. Yes. Uh, there, was there, unless I read it wrong, was there some comment that was submitted from um, a provider for for this section? There was um, a public comment submitted in writing. Um, it has been made a part of the materials for the board as well as a part of the public materials. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I was not aware of that. I'll take a look at it after the, uh, after the meeting. Um, moving on to item three, uh, update by representatives of Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, do we have anyone from DCA or we're moving quickly. Um, we were expecting to have one of the managers from the fiscal office with us. Um, I'm, we'll keep an eye out for him shortly. Um, we have a written report. There has been a quite a bit of um, staff change within the Office of uh, Board and Bureau Services. Uh, of course, biggest change, we uh, had a new director appoint appointed, um, Kim Kirchmer, who's the uh, well, is no longer the uh, executive director of the medical board on the 28th of October will be taking position as director of the department. Um, the uh, current deputy director, Chris Schultz, uh, will also be moving to another uh, state department. And then we've had several of our folks uh, from uh, Board and Bureau Services, Patrick Lay, who has uh, often covered our board, um, has moved to this the state legislature and um, Karen Nelson we'll see later on today but she's also making a move to the uh, American Leadership Foundation. Uh, good morning Brian sir how are you? So uh, with that we will go right on ahead into perfect timing <laughs> for our budget update. Morning sorry for the uh, just to uh, walk in right as it's time to go I guess. <laughs> Uh, good morning, members of the board. Uh, my name is Brian Skewis. I am a budget manager here at Consumer Affairs. Uh, Marie Reyes couldn't be here today, so I'm going to go ahead and give this update. I was asked for, to present a general budget update as it pertains to the board. I'm going to discuss the condition of the board's fund and also the state of its uh, current year budget. Uh, the fund is basically a savings account from which each year's budget is allocated and revenue is deposited. The board started fiscal year 2019-20 with just under $3 million in the fund, which is equivalent to over 15 months of operating expenses. Uh, the board is currently authorized to spend approximately $2.4 million and is scheduled to collect $2 million. This leaves a gap of approximately $350,000, um, which will cause the fund balance to decline over the years. While operating in a structural imbalance ultimately erodes the fund, this is not a major concern at this time due to a high fund balance. Uh, if operations continue at this rate, a fee increase or cost restructuring should be explored in the next two to four years, so uh, nothing immediate to address right now in that, con in that regard. Uh, currently, the budget office is working on building fiscal year 2020-2021 budget for release uh, by the governor's office in January. Uh, with that building comes several adjustments that also affect the board's current year budget. These adjustments are generally associated uh, with the cost of doing business, employee compensation, benefits, um, and uh, other contract type costs like the inter attorney general rate increase that took place this year. Uh, due to the timing of these adjustments, expenditure projections aren't as accurate as they could be because the budgeted allotment is currently in flux. Uh, generally, final budget and projections will be available in late November starting uh, or early December. So I have some more uh, information to share with you guys probably at the next board meeting as far as current year expenditures and the final budget al allotment. 
Uh, last year's the last year the board's budget was pretty tight. Uh, at the budget office, we're aware of those restrictions, and we'll continue to work with staff to ensure that we uh, stay within the confines of the budget and utilize our resources as best we can. All in all, I see a pretty healthy fund balance with sufficient reserves. Uh, however, we want to pay close attention to the board's uh, current year expenditures or you know budgetary expenditures uh, to ensure solvency and to make sure that uh, we stay within those restrictions. So if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this time. Um, and yeah. So uh, starting on that end, do we have any questions? Yes. All right. So so if it stays like this and and you know, a couple more years down the road, we're running a deficit. What what do we have to do to increase revenues? Sure. So um, there's uh, ultimately three ways to balance a budget. You can increase revenue, you can decrease expenditures, or you can do a combination of the both. As far as increasing uh, revenues, there's two avenues that that can be um, explored. You can either explore it through legislation or you can explore it through regulation. Uh, through regulation, if you have room to go, do you guys have room in regulations? You do. Okay. So for for you guys, ultimately, um, the first step would be increasing those fees through regulation. Uh, we have a regulatory process and a whole unit here at DCA that's uh, here to help you guys with that process. Uh, generally, increasing fees through regulation is a little bit more uh, streamlined than going through legislation. You have to kind of do a fee audit and justify the fees when you go through uh, through changes in, in legislation. Through regulation, they've already given you the authority to reach a certain threshold. So as long as you stay within that threshold, it's a relatively easy process. So one more question, and it, you might be better answered, Chair. If, if and when the optician and optometry funds are merged, will we save money? No. <laughs> um, I, the programs have really you know, run themselves. I think that when we first, when the board first began talking about combining the opticianry and the optometry funds, there was concern that the optometry fund would be sort of paying for the underlying of the opticianry program, and that's not what we've seen. Um, we are running a pretty lean, mean machine. Uh, there have been a lot of gains in the last couple of years, and I think that uh, and as I'm looking at the, the budget more and understanding sort of what we had um, as far as staffing and as far as uh, our caseloads particularly, um, we had some savings in the last several years. And now as we are including um, you know, both programs in rigorous enforcement programs, um, you know, we have analysts to actually work the cases and we're moving those through to the Attorney General. We're seeing increases in those, th those expenditures. Um, I don't foresee that there's uh, a budget savings. Once the two funds are combined, it's really an ability for us to move our resources more nimbly. That's what I'm looking for, is that when we've got peaks in applications for optometry right around graduation, I'm able to move licensing staff from our optician rate program to fill in and, and make sure that our times are, are st stay within our standards. When we've got ABO scores coming out from uh, uh, optician rate, that we are able to move our licensing staff over to handle those peaks. I really see the funds coming together as our ability to operate better um, and really address the needs of both programs, but not, not in a way in which we'll be saving uh, cost savings in either program. And I would just add, add to that that um, from a fund condition standpoint, both funds are in similar condition as far as uh, the amount of revenue and the amount of expenditures. The opticianry fund is uh, relatively balanced, although slightly imbalanced, and the uh, optometry fund is a, a little bit more imbalanced. But for the most part, I don't see one fund subsidizing the other if they were to merge. Thank you. Yeah, and that I was looking for that, oh, that was going to be my question. And the only thing we talked about is uh, now we're going to build opticianary schools that we would have uh, student interns to help you. Would that just be an internship that could help with that? In Mark, oh yeah, we have any more questions? Okay, okay, sorry. In March 2016, I believe the board voted on the, the cap that we can go to under regulation, I believe, for what license renewal fees are. So we have room to grow there. Not that I want us to go up on that, but I, I just I need a reminder of how, how much room do we have between what we, we ask for now versus how far we can go under what we voted on in that year. Mark, we've been looking at this. Do you recall what our cap is in? No, let me look up 
while you're looking that up, why don't we... Do you have any other questions? Dr. That was my only question. Okay. Dr. Kawaguchi? So my question is actually similar, and that is um, I think it's going to be important for us as a board to know what our average running decrease is per timeline getting into our reserves um, so that we can figure out if we have enough room through regulation, through fees, to be able to cover that and stop that uh, invasion into the reserves. So um, you were mentioning that the next by the next meeting you'll have more data for us. Sure. Is do we get the most data at the end of the fiscal year or just after the end of the fiscal year? It, it kind of depends on, on which information you're looking for. Uh, if you're looking for uh, fund condition data as far as the ultimate um, position of the board financially, uh, generally the end of the fiscal year has the most certainty when the year's been uh, closed and we know exactly how much revenue was collected and exactly how many expenditures uh, were ultimately paid out. Uh, from a... Um, from the perspective of looking at what your budget authority is, generally that's going to happen mid-year because uh, the budget building process uh, takes place over ultimately 14 months. So we're, like I said, we're kind of working on 2021 budget building right now, and while we're doing that, the 1920 budget is still in flux a little bit. Uh, generally speaking, those are increases to the board's budget. But if you're looking at uh, the fund and, and fees, uh, I, can, I can kind of give you an idea of where we're at right now, and that's about... Three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars difference in revenue and expenditures, collecting about three hundred, three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars less than you're authorized to spend per year. Per year, correct. And with uh, and with three million dollars in the fund, it would take several years for that to get down into the danger zone, so to speak. Uh, so, my conservative estimate of two to four years would be planning far enough ahead to be able to address it from a legislative perspective, from a regulatory perspective, if you need to do a fee audit to determine what those fees should be, uh, that timeline would give you time uh, to address it from all of those angles if necessary. And that really be, being two dual tracks, am I right, Brian? So working in order for the to increase to our, through regulation, right? We know that the regulatory package review timeline is somewhere between a year to a year and a half. So um, looking at running that concurrently with doing a fee survey um, so that we're able to bring to the legislature the information that we would need in order to then have additional legislative authority to increase the, the, the cap of for our fees. Through, through our regulations. So then I'm saying that it's two dual, it's two, two dual running tracks that one, we would need to in the next two to three years work on regulations in order to get to our cap, but that we additionally need to be running a fee study over here in order to understand whether or not that cap is actually big enough to uh, take on all of the expenses that we have. So is there, we, we have an authority now, let's get ourselves through regulation to that authority in order to cover the $300, $400 gap that we've got. But concurrently doing a fee survey in order to understand whether or not ultimately that cap that we have now is high enough. Okay. Hello? Okay. Our, uh, our cap in statute is $500 for renewal fees, which is our big one. And uh, in statute, it's $425 right now. Um, and our fee for applicants applying for license is $275 in statute. And in regulations, that's capped at $275. So we have a little bit of room in the renewal fee, but not anything else, really. Everything else is pretty much up at the max. What about optician fees? Those are optician fees. Those are optometrists. I'm sorry? Those are for the optometrists. Oh, optician oh, fees. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Give me a second, please. Optician fees uh, are at $250 for renewals right now and cap at 300 So you've got some room to grow in, in regulations regarding renewal fees. That's the biggest category of revenue for, the, uh, for most programs, and uh, including optometry. Um, all of your know, fee increase conversations in general right now are, are definitely premature. Um, while I mentioned that because we're structurally imbalanced, I, I think that uh, even the discussion of a fee audit or, any, or um, 
even exploring the avenues of increasing fees through regulation is probably at least four years out at this point. So I think you guys have a, a significant amount of time before any of that can see, uh, any of that is necessary, uh, barring any extreme growth in expenditure authority or any extreme decrease in licensing population. So. Uh, I don't think it's necessary, necessarily an action item uh, for you guys in the, in the short term, but uh, it's just definitely something to be aware of that you are spending or authorized to spend more than you're collecting uh, for, a, for future discussion. Okay. Dr. Wong, any questions? Uh, no questions. So I have a few questions um, in no particular order. Uh, my recollection is that during the... Um, economic downturn in <clears throat> 2008, 2009, the board loaned the, the state or the general fund some, some money, monies. Has that been repaid back to the board? Uh, I cannot say with certainty today whether or not that's been repaid. I would have to go back and look at uh, a historical fund condition to see if it's been repaid. Okay. Um, with that being said, the general rule of thumb with uh, general fund loans is that while there is a schedule for repayment, if it can be deferred, if it needs to be deferred, it will. And so the, the term we throw around is that you'll get it back when you need it. <laughs> um, and you certainly don't need it right now you have, with 15 months of operating expenses in the fund. Um, that being said, it will continue to generate interest while it's out and, and loaned. Um, while not the greatest investment, it is generating interest. Right. Uh, but yeah, before you would be able to increase fees, it would be required that those loans be repaid. So you guys can't even increase fees until, those, until that general fund loan is repaid. So that's another kind of cushion for us. Exactly. Okay. Um, questions about how the travel budget works. I know we've heard messages about how there's a desire that we decrease our travel expenses, but it seems befuddling to me because our, our fund condition is really strong. Um, why we would want to decrease our, our, our travel budget. We've been kind of doing pretty much a shoestring operation anyway without kind of outlandish travel, travel to locations where we have an audience for more Californians. So can you explain how that, how that works and how how we, whether, who, who controls it, how we control that, um, anything you can offer. Sure. Uh, unaware of any particular directives as far as, as restricting travel other than out-of-state travel, obviously we need authorization to do that right. uh, to represent California and another state. Um, as far as uh, travel expenditures or authorization, uh, we have line item budgets for each of those categories. You know, Who's we? Uh, Consumer affairs, when we build your budget, there is a line item for travel. There's a line item for general expense and employee compensation benefits. And there's a line item for everything, essentially. Uh, at the, but at the end of the day, it is a bottom line budget. So all of those line items add up to a total budget of approximately, what, $2.2 million for op, uh, the op, optometry fund, excuse me. Um, and as long as you don't overexpend that bottom line authority, at the end of the day, that's you know within the restrictions of your budget. You don't necessarily have to stay within your travel line item if it's ten thousand dollars and you spend eleven. That's okay as long as you don't exceed your bottom line budget. Uh, as far as travel restrictions, uh, you know, in the age of technology, as communication becomes easier from distance locations sure if there's anything you can do to to lean out and create some savings there that would just free up operating expenses for other mission critical activities however I'm unaware of any specific restrictions regarding travel right now okay okay in our particular case it kind of alluding back to uh, you know we've been had some lean times and the ability to have savings in staffing, have savings in um, our expenditures out to the Attorney General's office. As we've picked up and come on full staff, as we've pursued um, a fuller caseload, that we don't have those other po pockets of money or buckets to pull from as much as we once did. And so we're finding that we're looking more closely at our line item budgets, our authority, um, which particularly in travel is low, but um, then trying to be creative or think about ways in which we can look at other things that 
are mission critical, though. I mean, the, the need to have staff to do the work and the need to um, send, uh, you know, uh, accusations and statements of issues to the attorney generals is important to, you know, the running of our, our board. Um, so trying to figure out how we can find those savings when we're no longer getting them in the places that we used to. Um, you mentioned a attorney general rate increase. What was it and what is it now? The attorney general rate increase, uh, well, we were notified of it in, in early July and it was effective in September. Uh, so we have about 10 months of that rate increase this year and a full year moving forward. The attorney general rate went from 175 or 195 to 220 and then there were other rates that were increased as well, legal assistant hours and uh, legal analyst hours, uh, those were uh, increased as well. All in all, it's uh, approximately uh, preliminary projections for optometry is about $200,000 increase in the current year and about $220,000 increase ongoing, that difference being just from the two months where the rate stayed the same. Um, we have control section language in the budget to, uh, or in the in the budget act to augment programs budget budgetary line item for attorney general. Uh, so as we see those increases take place, if we're exceeding our attorney general budget, we have the ability to increase the attorney general line item by the at that estimated increase. So we have a way to to make that line item whole. Uh, similarly, as we would with. Uh, the other current year adjustments that take place regarding benefits and employee compensation. So as the cost of doing business is increased, we make the program's budget whole based on those increases. Okay. So um, next question, as, we were, as we're looking at possible fee increases, you said, well, that's not an immediate concern. You can look four, three to four years out. Um, that's great, but I'm thinking, well, what if we're in a recession four years from now? Um, what is the history of boards asking for fee increases during the last recession? And wouldn't that make the likelihood that the loan will be repaid also unlikely? Yes and yes and no. So th there are a couple questions there, and I'll, I'll uh, try to address each of them and make sure I keep me honest. I get all of them. Uh, first one being uh, increase. Or, or the likelihood of getting a general fund loan reback, loan back during an economic downturn. Um, those rules don't change. If you are out of money and you're owed money, you're going to get that general fund loan repayment back before you're out of money, so to speak. Um, we'll I'll hold you to that. Yeah. <laughs> you, can hold the, you can hold the governor's office. To yeah, I'm going to hold the governor. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. That. Yeah. You, I understand. Gonna, I understand. Yeah. Right. I mean, there would be far bigger problems than than your few million dollars getting back if, if that was an issue. Um, as far as fee increases in economic downturns, uh, you know, I would have to go back and look at specific fee increases that took place in 2007-8-9. Um, with that being said, anything that would have to happen from a legislative perspective or a regulatory perspective would have to have the justification behind it regardless of the state of the economy. So I don't think that that's necessarily a concern. If we're in an economic downturn and we're facing budget cuts, or uh, further budgetary restrictions that would help the fund condition in the grand scheme of things. So uh, it, at the end of the day, we have to justify it regardless. And if you need the fee increase and it is uh, is justified, it'll be approved. Okay. I just don't want to have to like have a choice between that and cutting staff, for example. Sure. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, those are all the questions I have. Are, do the, any of the board members have questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. We appreciate it. So is it time for the, oh, executive, we have executive director's report. You ready, Sharon? Yes. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have any public comment on the last item? Thank you for that mind, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I should know better. I, I do this. Um, in my other practice. Um, next item, we're going to move to item 12, the executive director's report. So we actually move to... Oh, I'm sorry. I just... <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get out of my job here. The president's report. Um, my report is um, actually very brief. We've you know issued press releases and, and other things about the... Um, 
uh, election of the new officers. I hope the board members saw that little press release. Um, what I wanted to say during my time in the president's report is, is really kind of a mundane administrative matter regarding uh, the per diem. Um, as you might recall, about a year ago, we uh, the, the board passed changes to the board member handbook to say that the board members would be paid per diem, um, the per diem for the board meeting and per diem for the prep for the board meeting, right? And we had some discussion, and, and then kind of, that's kind of all we said. Um, occasionally, I'll get requests from board members uh, for um, per diem for trainings that they attend. Um, I look back over the tapes and the discussions, and, and there was no discussion during our meeting um, as to how to how to deal with those per diem requests. The the um, the board member handbook gives the president authority to utilize my discretion to award per diems upon request. And this is the practice I've been following. Um, if a board member attends like an all-day training, uh, required training, like the board member orientation, um, I, I think that's worth a, a, full, a full per diem. Um, we're also tasked to uh, attend or take online some shorter trainings, like driver's ed, sexual harassment, things like that. Um, I've been using my discretion to say, well, those are small bits of time, but they are, they are the board member's time. So um, my rule of thumb is if in any given year, in any given year we're required to take a bunch of them. So once the board member completes all those shorter trainings, um, then um, those are eligible for the total for one, one, one per diem for all those shorter ones. So mm -hmm. I just want to report to the board that that is how I'm exercising my discretion um, for the trainings because they are required and, and we know about them in advance. There's no need to follow the procedure where you have to request um, permission before, before you go. Um, but I wanted to announce that that is how I'm applying the per diem rule in my discretion. If Board members have any comment? If you want to change that practice, we can, but I just wanted to announce that for the board members' information. Um, so I have a question. I thought you could also just say I did an hour and then submit that hour and then staff keeps a track of it and they they total it up to eight hours and then they reimburse you. Um, Is that not how it's been in the past? I, I don't know if, if that has been the case. We, Jessica, do you know? what we've done in the past, and then I'll comment on what I think so we should do. we have a bank of hours on a spreadsheet where members have submitted, you know, I, I've done X number of hours for this activity or X number of hours for this activity. So several of the members have um, have banked hours. Okay. Um, we can do it however the board members want to do it. I, I'm trying to... Um, go by the principle of not requiring the board members to keep track of their hours, right? So, at least for the trainings, I thought, all right, well, so we can just say, if you complete however many number of trainings you're required to do that year, that's, that's enough, enough for the per diem, so you don't have to keep track of how many hours you're, you're attending. Uh, all right. Um, and, and, and the trainings go up and down, right? Sometimes you may only have two. You, some years you have more, um, but uh, uh, that's how I'm exercising my discretion. So, all right, hearing nothing else, uh, that's my president's report. Okay, and with that, we will move to item number twelve, executive officer's report, um, and we will begin with the enforcement program report, and that will be given by our acting. Assistant Executive Officer, Sheree Kimball. So for the first quarter of um, 
2019-2020, um, we've been working on updating the disciplinary guidelines both for the optometry program and the optician program. Um, you'll be seeing the ones for the optometry program in a little bit. Um, and the, so, and these are some disciplinary actions that were taken in the first quarter. Um, sorry, I'm not looking at the same thing that I'm looking at. So we, um, these are decisions that you voted on um, at the last board meeting or in between them, and those are effective. Um, and that's Do we have any questions? Sorry, let's start on this end. Dr. Wong? Oh, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Dr. Kawaguchi? Questions. No questions. Okay. No questions. No questions. Dr. Krovsky. Um, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling through to get to that page, but how are we on the, um, the high priority cases and the, um, any, any time delays on attending to those high priority cases? The high priority cases are still worked um, uh, before other cases, so as things come in for them, they kind of jump the line and are worked next, so there aren't time delays really for the high priority cases. Um, and as far as where they're at in the process exactly, I don't know. So I'm, I'm seeing on that chart um, that the high priority cases, the average days to closure is 404 days. Is that right? Yes. Is that good, bad, average compared to our previous years? That I can't say. Um, it was only the average over two cases, so it's hard to say what went into those two cases exactly. Um, if they went out for field investigation at, with DMI or if they went to an expert for review, both of those things are going to add time. And um, for our high priority cases, it's more common that, that we need to do those things. Right. Actually, now that you're mentioning that, I recollect I asked about this at the last meeting, and um, there was something about these two cases that were very unique that required that we had to wait for somebody else to do something before we could proceed on those cases. So the 404 is not that, not that much of a concern, and it is just two cases. So, all right, thank you. Any other questions about the questions? Great. With that, we'll move to examination and licensing programs, and that will be presented by our licensing lead, Arsha Kasmi. The licensing unit successfully completed another year of processing applications um, with new graduates. This year we did have the highest that we've had in the past three years. We are looking at 366, 366 applications completed. Um, this, like I said, was the highest number of applications received in the past three years. Um, despite, this, despite this uptick and staffing concerns, we were still able to keep it in a eight to ten week time frame. Um, and that was, of course, set forth by our executive officer. We made sure to <laughs> move things around and make, make it happen for our uh, applicants. Um, staff has issued an additional 154 new licenses since July. Um, so that's the, when the first quarter started. Uh, this is concurrent to the months of July through September. Uh, it has become really busy around this time because we have had... Um, of course, these are the individuals that have uh, either uh, failed the NBEO and are retaking it, and now they immediately want to be licensed, or people that have failed um, the um, law exam and, again, immediately want to be licensed now that they passed it. Um, and, of course, then there's always the latecomers where they started the process back in September of last year, and now they're like, oh, I forgot to send this in. Here you go. Um, so they're very late in getting in all the necessary items required for licensure. Um, so now that everybody has uh, sent in everything, we've tried to immediately get those people out the door because we understand that you know they all have jobs and whatnot and ready. And so we um, 
licensed 154 applicants just in the three months alone. Um, after this peak season, uh, current processing times have returned to normal as of six weeks. Um, since the first quarter started, we've already received 51 exam requests. Um, because of this increase, we do believe that this year is also going to be a pretty big year. Um, and as we've been seeing year by year, there's been more folks wanting to come into California and the numbers are rising when it comes to licensing um, folks for our state. Yeah. The lead uh, licensing analyst um, <laughs> is currently uh, working with um, the Office of Information Services, or BREEZE unit, within the Department of Consumer Affairs to streamline application processes um, for fictitious name permits in particular. This year, we have noticed that there were a lot of uh, optometrists that submitted fictitious name permits um, in error. Um, apart from the one that they already had. This actually uh, has made uh, licensing staff personally having to reach out to each and every person trying to get these fixed, trying to um, get refunds in. It's been a process. And so because of this error, we uh, I've been working with Breeze, um, our, our Breeze uh, team to make the application much more clear. Um, we are looking at probably these um, uh, the, these changes to be put in um, at least around the beginning of next year. That's at least the aim. Um, as of September, processing times for fictitious name permits have normalized to six to eight weeks. Um, we are redirecting applicants to apply for the correct license type and will stop applicants from recreating a duplicate fictitious name permit, which was also a very big issue that we were having, um, along with the erroneous um, fictitious name permits per, uh, submitted. Arsha, can I ask you a question? For those people who are applying for these, or mistakenly applying for the fictitious name permits, are they new grads? Are they, do they just, do they not understand the application? There's been um, a combination of both new and older. So the, so it's a two-pronged problem. So yes, we have had new grads that um, came in and they started applying for fictitious name permit just randomly. Um, but more so we've been seeing existing optometrists that already had an existing uh, fictitious name permit applying for it again. And all of a sudden this is putting a big this is making this is causing an issue because now we have duplicate with the same name causing this issue where we're now having to be like wait the, you can't have two locations with the same address you know so it's doing a lot of back end work um, for um, our uh, staff that handles that program. Well, I know that like when we well when I go to Berkeley and then when we also have other people going to other optometry schools in was it usually April March April or May for the new grads this is something that we can mention to them and, and yes. point out so if you can just show show me or show us when we go talk to the schools then I think that would at least Definitely. minimize the number of mistaken applications for we them. are also having something similar on the um, statement of licensure side but those are much more of a quicker fix so um, but yes we, we we were talking about it as well um, Nancy who handles um, these and uh, we were actually looking at possibly when we go out to the schools to better educate them on what um, applications they need to submit right when they're done and kind of explaining the difference between all the applications we have because we do have a lot especially with the incorporation of the RDO stuff as well so definitely it is something that's in our purview to um, move forward with. Uh, Dr. Kawaguchi had a follow-up yeah, question. Follow question to that so I do think that you're on the right track um, working with the Breeze team because Breeze is in some ways a mixed blessing uh, it creates a landing page for us as a practitioner where we can see what we have, what we have pending. Um, sometimes it's difficult to assess what we may need. And so I think that your solution of working with that team to clarify the instructions on those pages is going to be the solution to avoid this extra work for everybody. So thank you for seeing that. Thank you for acknowledging that, yes, because that, that is basically 
when we look at it, when I talk to optometrists um, or when Nancy talks to them, we, we, we hear their concerns. So especially now that she was reaching out to so many applicants, um, this was one of the things that they were saying. They were just like, this is so confusing. We need something a little bit more understanding, more explaining it out. Um, and because of that, we decided we're like, okay, let's let's move this this route and let's try to see if we can fix it, um, the application process itself to better understand uh, moving forward. Do we have any question? Uh, more questions from the board at this juncture? I, I just want to find out. You are going to move into the optician part of it, right? Yes. We are. Okay. I'll wait. <laughs> I have a question on that. Doctor Dorsey. Doctor David. Two questions. Um, any idea how? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> any idea how many? <laughs> how many optometrists um, drop off the list? Uh, you said you just added 154 in the last quarter. How, any idea how many optometrists usually drop off in the course of a year, either surrendering their licenses, going to retired status, or they're deceased? Something on that order. We do have. Um, so on my end, um, with new applicants, we have had um, out-of-state applicants that decide to drop out from the application process. Um, so far, I've only had two this year, um, and it's because they feel our CEs are a bit too much compared to their current state. Um, and of course, I do explain to them that we are the gold standard. <laughs> we do believe in education, um, and we definitely want our uh, optometrists to, uh, you know, have those CEs prior to coming into California. So there have been so far this year two. Um, as for actual existing optometrists from California, um, yes, we do have a number. Uh, many of them either call us in and decide to say, hey, we're moving out of state, we want to go inactive. Um, then there's, of course, the other scenario where they're like, uh, we don't know if we want to continue because we're looking at retiring. And then there's always the, hey, you know, we do get that phone call where they have been deceased. I can't tell you off the top of my head exactly how many we get per a year, um, but it's not too many. Okay, so we're licensing more folks than are dropping off the rolls. Absolutely. Okay. One more question then. Um, is there, I'm sure there is, are you still running into confusion with um, ODs that have branch office licenses and they just need to convert them to SOLs? No, we've been really good at um, helping ODs step by step with the branch office license because we took, so we, we, we went with this um, as a two-pronged approach. A, we sent out so many letters prior to um, the BOLs getting discontinued. Shara was instrumental in saying, hey, let's send out the first letter. Let's be more communicative um, online, on our website, and etc. cetera. Um, and then we went with the Breeze approach where we actually just pulled out that application completely. So there was no pathway for anybody to actually apply for a BOL. Hence, we did receive a lot more phone calls saying, hey, I need to renew my BOL, where is it? And that's when we started, man like, per a call, actually educating individuals saying, hey, so we've let go of BOL. This is the new step that you need to take and educate them better. I, I, I'm, I'm just looking at the board's website, and it still says that branch office licenses can be registered through Breeze. It's not there. The application it's not, not there. there. So it's it's written there, but if you go to Breeze, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Okay. Dr. Tureski, where is that? Uh, it's, um, it's on the board's website under uh, forms and publication and under licensees. Okay. Thank you. We'll take care of it. Now, because forms and publications, that's something that um, I know we archive forms, um, so I'm assuming that's the reason why that's there, but the only way to apply for those is online through Breeze, and that step is not there. David, that was a great question, and, and kudos to staff for implementing one of our major legislative initiatives, kind of without major glitches. It's really, it's, it's very impressive. I'm, I'm very proud of what this board and staff has done. Uh, Dr. Wong? Could we 
So on the website, since there, since be, the branch office license still is under the forms and publications, could you just put an additional part under when they're trying to renew their license, saying apply for BOL, and if they were to click on that, then it would say, oh, hey, actually, you need an SOL now. So then that way, it, would, it might take a little bit less staff time for yeah, education because it would just be an additional little that, click. Yeah. So we interrupt your report. Why don't you go ahead and continue? So on did, you have, did you have a question before we moved on? I have a question. Dr. Arsha, earlier this year we spoke a little bit about how I think there might be some confusion among optometrists thinking that once they have a license to practice, they've got this written license that they can post, but they don't realize they need an SOL as well. Um, do you have any idea or could venture any guesses to the number of optometrists or percentage of optometrists who may be under that? that belief that that license is their license to practice at a location without a statement of licensure? So when, during the application process, um, an applicant has, they reach out to us constantly. Um, throughout the whole process, I mean, I can tell you, I can get either five emails from a single applicant to 25 emails, literally, depending on how and how, you know, where they are in the process and how much assistance they need, and we're always there to help them. Um, in this process, right when they're like, right when they get licensed, they immediately let us know that they are going to be practicing and so and so. And we are now encouraging them to let us know that they are practicing. Um, of course, for the initial license, they just have to show us their address of record, and that's going to be their address of record. As, and we let them know because this is your first one. It's stated, this is your address of record, you're good to go. Moving forward, you will be needing to do an SOL if there's going to be a second address. So we are proactively um, educating our new folks coming in. I can't tell you exactly the number, <laughs> if there is a mistake or anything like that, but um, many optometrists as well, from my understanding, are explaining to their employees, because you are working here, you will need to um, you know, do this with the board. So there is that aspect. I have heard a few folks call me back and say, hey, Arsha, because I'm working at two places, somebody's telling me I need to do this SOL. And I explain to them exactly why. So yes, there's that. I, I can't really tell you exactly how many don't know or how many do know, but we are focusing, we are trying to assist them in that process and educate them better. As with all of our moving forward, you know, all of every process in general, we try to educate them as well as we can. I think my concern is not necessarily for new licensees, but for existing licensees who may not understand. Because um, it was my impression back then that I had my license to practice, and then if I had another location, I had a branch office license. Not realizing I needed an SOL for the primary location. My that's what I'm wondering. Do we have doctors out there just using that initial license and not having a statement of licensure for, for their primary location? I will tell you we do. And the way that I know this is because we receive calls all the time saying, oh, I work here, but I work here. And we're like, we're, we don't see an SOL for this. Where is it? So we do have to then go back and educate them and walk them through the process. So there is that still. Um, Maybe we can put something uh, online. I was going to say, is there any way that we can just put that out there? Maybe, again, with the, uh, I know we're probably inserts or whatever for license renewals, but say, do you have your SOL for your location? That could be a source of income. You never know. What are they, $25 or something for an SOL? I don't know. Um, um, I was speaking with staff uh, regarding renewals in particular because we were thinking possibly on the renewal page to have something stating what an SOL is, why you would need it, and what a FMP is, and why you would need it. So it is something that we have been looking into, um, and 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 we probably will be moving 
towards that. And we are looking at the communication renewals. We had uh, a good discussion during, I believe, the Ledge Reg Committee, um, and then also possibly during CPC, about the need to educate licensees regarding infectious disease control guidelines. Um, so we will be looking this in the next few months at that renewal communication and looking at how we can look at more pointed messages that might be helpful to folks. So we'll include that, that SOL language as well. Thank you. Sorry, I have another follow-up to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shara, uh, when we are working on CLRE uh, with expert um, experts coming in yes. to develop questions for our test, is there any presentation by our board staff to ensure that those people understand where the pain points possibly are for their peers so that they have at least some guidance on maybe questions and how to direct them? Is that something that happens when we get those experts in? So we really do very much try to allow them to guide us through um, understanding, you know, the, the current uh, state of the profession and the, the current needs. Um, it, it's not an opportunity we have with this administration uh, uh, taking more opportunity to use this as sort of communication opportunities. Um, so we do send staff over when we have those subject matter expert groups come in to introduce ourselves, let them know about additional opportunities, to tell them about any of the things that are going on with the board at that time. But we haven't used it in that sort of uh, particular way so it'll be interesting if there are uh, maybe a, an additional discussion of how we might look at, at using those communication opportunities yeah because I think that it, it doesn't have to be specific obviously but if we just got gave them data points about here's the most common enforcement issue that we see with optometrists here's the most common you know then it's going to give them ideas about the kind of questions that they may want to formulate I think um, so I think it'll make the test more effective any other comments? I, I will say, as my last thought and comment is, given the sentiment of the board and given what the staff is doing, um, which is proper, and that is educating folks about the SOL, as opposed to enforcing the law through penalties and whatnot, um, I, my sense of the board is that we're not very, we would not be very excited were an enforcement action be brought before us for mere failure of getting an SOL. So I think, I think I'll, that's all I need to say about that. Um, why don't you continue your, your report? Um, as for the opti uh, opticianary, um, to address concerns regarding processing times within the opticianary program, um, staff has spent a lot of energy in both August and September uh, of this year uh, auditing the processes to try to streamline them. Um, this includes all the spectacle lens, the contact lens, the RDO, and the non-contact, uh, non-registered contact lens. So um, applicants um, are being sent the deficiency letters within 30 days. Uh, this has improved um, some processing times uh, and reduced volume of calls um, and mail sent out from our board. Uh, we've also worked towards removing um, some items such as um, the required photo and the notarization because that has changed um, since we've adopted this program. Um, and this also has allowed our uh, applicants to apply much quicker um, and try to move through the process versus having to wait to go get notarized and just another step um, that we remove. So another restriction I would call because it was a hindrance to many folks um, in the past. So we definitely wanted to put that out there. We removed it on the breeze aspect. We removed it on the website where now it's pretty straightforward. No notarization will be required um, to get the application in. Um, as the American Board of Opticianary um, ABO exam results posted in August and September, um, the optician program kind of peaked, but then despite even that, uh, we were still in the four to six week processing times. Um, in August, management um, hired a new uh, management service technician uh, to assist the program. Um, and this has allowed that stabilization um, when we did have those peaks. Um, 
As for the optometry examination, um, CSBO and the Office of Professional Examination Services within the Department of Consumer Affairs continue to work hand in hand to update current laws and regulations uh, in the California Laws and Regulations exam. An updated version of the CLRE is under review and will be released this fall. Yes. Do you have any questions? I have a couple questions. I understood that once um, an SLD and a CLD and the RDOs, once they submit their application and their payment, that it would be like a PDF file in their file, something to that effect where if they needed to reprint it uh, instead of you mailing it out. Uh, my guess is that you do at this point email them. Email, yes. You email them, and they have this file, and if they ever lose it, they could just reprint it from that file. That's correct, yes. and, and that can happen, like, overnight. Is that correct? Yes. So that's where it's at right now. Yes. Now, so with we, that... We've ahead. been trying to work with our Breeze uh, team as well um, regarding uploading uh, documentation and whatnot. Um, it is a SIR that's underway that uh, we are uh, very much involved in, and uh, we're hoping that also helps in that. Um, in that process and trying to get applications in faster and complete them faster. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that as well. <laughs> okay. Now, um, are the RDO for, for uh, companies, do they know about the new process? Because then they can communicate out to all, you know, the new upcoming SLDs and CLDs. This is the way you're going to now process your application. Do you have that already sent out to them so they're notifying? Here's yes, a big change. We have been kind of contemplating some ideas on um, okay. what to do, and there was a letter that was sent out um, yeah. regarding this, but we are still going to probably do some follow up um, regarding that as well. And, and then maybe have it on the website? Yes. That would be accessible for everyone. Just check the website as well. Very good point. Yes, okay. <laughs> absolutely. Thanks. That's it. Any other questions by board members? Um, yeah, so I, I have to go backwards to just the optometry license. So I've still had a couple of people who I think are confused about renewing their licenses and the processing times. So they, they'll submit all their stuff one week before the end of the month and then they are calling or emailing me saying I don't have a license and I, I mean I know on our website it says four to six weeks is there any way that we can put a little asterisk or something saying you need to submit your all of your material four to six weeks or six weeks before the expiration yeah. of your license and I think because I've had a couple people ask me like oh I didn't realize that while my license is being processed I, I can't practice and and then that's when then that's when I start getting emails or phone calls. We also too, as part of a, a, a big shift in the licensing unit, we're looking at doing process mapping and, and looking at our procedures and looking at places where we can um, better automate what we do and then also communicate to folks where they are in the process. So we're hoping that in the next year we'll be able to better identify our processes and then find places in which it makes sense to communicate with licensees when we're not communicating now. Yeah, but I think if we would just let all, everyone who's renewing their licenses, just let them know, hey, you have to submit everything six weeks in advance and not the day before that you might get a less, few less panic calls. Actually, um, if they renew online mm -hmm. through the Breeze program and they've paid the fees and they've checked all the boxes and everything is complete when they submit the application, it immediately renews them. And if it hasn't done that, there's a problem and they should call us. Thank you. Any other questions? Did, Cherie, just to go with your statement, I renewed my license. My license is up at the end of this month. I renewed it second week in September. I had a new paper license in my hand in eight days. Yeah. Right, so it was, it was fast. Yeah, and if you go and look on uh, the online license verification through the green system, the search.dca.ca.gov, uh, your expiration date will automatically update so that's once you submit your renewal application go check your license and if it hasn't updated there's probably a problem and you should call us and so that we can help you fix that I'm just going to call attention to time here. We're at 10 uh, o'clock, which was our scheduled or minute till uh, our scheduled hearing. Um, so if it pleases the, the president, we would pause. I have one last word. 
<laughs> using my power as president. One is to, um, and although David's question partially answer this question is, in the in the long run, you may want to survey other states and find out what their processing time is to compare. Um, of course, I wouldn't want the headline that we have the slowest <laughs> processing time. But if we're if we are um, issuing licenses in eight days, that's pretty darn good. Um, I, I I want to thank you for a very complete report and abling ably answering our questions. It sounds like you are good at what you do. Thank you. So um, we will move on to item five, the uh, early termination hearing. Do I need to move from my seat? Oh, oh I'm sorry. We, I'm, I, I, I didn't ask for public comment on the last item. All right, seeing none, well, let's take a short break. Five, I'll pass the chair over to our administrative law judge. Good morning. Um, my name is Erin Koch Goodman, and I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. I'm here today to assist the board, uh, and we are before the California State Board of Optometry in reviewing the petition for early termination of probation that's been filed by uh, Rebecca Janine Savage. It has an agency case number of 800 2015 018224 and an Office of Administrative Hearings case number 20190908866. Um, we do have a court reporter. She's taking down everything everyone is saying. So I'll ask if everyone can make sure not to talk on top of one another. Let everyone finish their thoughts before the next person jumps in. In order to do that, I will try to identify people. And if you need uh, a moment, just Tell me that as well. Why don't I start with introductions from my far right side so that we have them for the record and I can announce a quorum. Uh, David Turetsky, professional member. Okay. Ruby Garcia, professional member. Deborah McIntyre, professional member. Glenn Kawaguchi. Mark Mordomi, president of the board. Lillian Wong, professional member. Very good. I can say that we do have a quorum of the board before us. Before going on the record, I had uh, a conversation with Ms. Savage, who is sitting before you on the right-hand side, and we discussed that I would be giving everyone an opportunity to make an opening statement. I would also be swearing her in, um, both for her statement to the board and for any questions uh, that may be given. But what I'm going to do is first start with appearances on behalf of the state. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Melissa Seamantle, Deputy Attorney General, and I am appearing on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people of the state of California. I am here to assist the panel in fact-finding. My role is not adversarial, but is intended to protect the public interest. I am here to ensure that the panel has adequate information from which to make a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seamantle. And uh, Ms. Savage, you are sitting before us today, is that correct? All right. I'm going to ask that you lean in a little to that microphone or bring the microphone closer to you. That's fine, too. Um, don't be afraid to be loud okay. so that we can all hear you. I'd like to start by swearing you in so that if you are, in fact, asked questions, that we can take that as evidence for today in your petition. So if you'd please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? Yes. All right, very good. Ms. Savage, I did say that I would give you an opportunity to make an opening statement. Might I suggest, however, that I'm going to let Ms. Seamantle introduce uh, the petition that you have filed and the documents that you filed with that petition so that we mark them and make them a part of the record. And she will also give us sort of a procedural history of how we've gotten to this place here. And then I'll have you respond. Is that all right? Yes. Okay, very good. Ms. Seamantle, the floor is yours. What has been previously provided, and I believe has been marked as Exhibit 1, includes the Notice of Hearing, Petitioner's Petition for Early Termination of Probation, her Statement of Explanation, Criminal Court Documents, including a Certificate of Completion of a DUI Compliance Program, 
a letter of optometry, I'm sorry, a letter to the Board of Optometry from petitioner, two emails regarding petitioner's community service, a letter from petitioner's therapist, three employee appreciation notices, a copy of petitioner's employee of the month award, and the decision and order in the matter of the accusation against Rebecca Janine Savage, board case number 800-2015-018-224, OAH case number 2017-080795. And if that, that exhibit would be entered in as part of the petition hearing. Ms. Savage, do you have any objection to uh, the board considering the packet that you have prepared uh, in an effort to terminate your probation early? No. All right. One is in evidence. Regarding a brief background of the case, the board issued petitioner contact lens dispenser number 1994 and spectacle lens dispenser number 6065 on or about September 9th of 2009. On or about July 18th of 2017, an accusation was filed against petitioner based upon her criminal convictions that were substantially related to the qualifications, functions, and duties of a registered contact lens dispenser and registered spectacle lens dispenser. The circumstances of the crimes were that on October 31st, 2015, petitioner drove a vehicle while under the influence of alcohol, struck another vehicle, and attempted to flee on foot. When a witness attempted to detain petitioner, she punched the witness in the face and fled until another witness detained her. A passenger in the other vehicle sustained a fractured sternum. Respondent's blood alcohol level was 0.12%. Pursuant to a stipulated settlement, petitioner's registrations were placed on probation with terms and conditions that included reimbursement to the board for its probation monitoring costs and cost recovery for the investigation enforcement of the case, which for the cost recovery was $3,325. Petitioner was also required to complete community service of free non-lens dispensing or professional lens dispensing services on a regular basis to a community or charitable facility or agency amounting to a minimum of eight hours per month of probation, abstention from the use of controlled substances and alcohol, and biological fluid testing. Because the burden is on petitioner, I have no further statements but would reserve the right to question the petitioner. Of course, Ms. Cimentel. Ms. Savage, before you, you have the packet that uh, Ms. Cimentel has given you that includes your petition. Do you recognize all of those documents that are contained in that packet? Yes, I do. All right. What uh, We have the board before you. We're going to give you an opportunity to make a statement now, and then um, we will open the floor to questions of you. The greatest concern for the board is rehabilitation, and I just want to make sure that I understand correctly, having read your petition, you are seeking one of two things. One is to be free of the biological fluid testing. Is that correct? Yes. And also, you are seeking to terminate your probation in its entirety. Yes. Okay. All right. The floor is yours. Um, sorry, I'm um, I am here because I would like to petition to... Um, possibly be rid of the urine analysis testing um, as it has been uh, financially difficult to afford. Um, I have completed um, more than a year without any hiccups or any bad testing um, and followed according to terms. Um, I'm also hoping it not to just delete that to, you know, permanently terminate my uh, probationary period. Um. <laughs> All right. Um, Dr. Tursky, do you have any questions? Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, Since you've been placed on probation, I assume that the folks you work, you're at Costco, correct? Yes. So the folks you work with at Costco know what's happened? Yes. 
How, how have they received you? How have they been dealing with this? Um, my warehouse manager um, has known me for quite some time and, um, and um, has stood with me and checked in on me and uh, followed closely to make sure that I've been doing okay. Um, she's very supportive um, and they, they know my situation. So. Prior to being placed on probation, were you able to work in the optical department on your own without anybody else there? Yes. Or was there always another, another license with you, another spectacle lens dispenser with you? Um, in fact, I used to be, I used to manage the department. Okay. And now I don't. I'm a full-time employee. And you always have to have somebody there with you since you... Well, no. You, can you still work I, on your own? I still am able to work on my own, I believe. Um, I usually don't okay. have that uh, problem because there's always an additional um, licensed employee there. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Ruby Garcia? Yes, I have a question. Um, does Costco put a time limit? I mean, they know that you were licensed already. Yes. Uh, do they are they saying because I, I do knew, know that unlicensed people have a time period to be in the department and if they don't pass the national exam and if they don't get licensed then they're going to have to transfer out is that something that is they're negotiating with you as well or uh, no not not for me as um, I've been granted a stay on my licenses right now okay. so I'm still able to work in the department um, and still considered licensed okay. um, right now, so not for me. Okay. But you are correct. All right. Thank you. Dr. McIntyre? Yes, other than the uh, financial considerations of the year analysis, being on the probation, what limitations has this placed on you? For uh, So why are you requesting early termination of that probation? What hardship is this exposing you to? Um, Yes, so I am asking for early termination. Um, I have a lot of, I work full time. Um, I do um, community service eight hours, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're splitting it on days off, and I help uh, care for my nephew as taking the school in the mornings and um, also assist with my brother who is paraplegic and take him to all his doctor's appointments, which is usually done on my days off. So I have um, quite a full schedule even though um, it doesn't seem like a lot for the community service, but it's still, it's time consuming with other things. Um, also, I am currently pregnant, um, so starting a family, and um, am concerned just what kind of time frame that's going to allow me to have to complete the requirements for the community service after and things like that. So um, that would be why. Okay, thank you. All right, Dr. Kawaguchi. Hello. Um, could you please just confirm that you are in 100% compliance of your probation, including cost recovery? Yes. So let me clarify further. It, um, Ms. Cimentel indicated that there was a cost for the investigation and enforcement of $3,325. Do you remember that amount? Yes, I do. Um, I'm currently doing a payment program for that which it's not uh, fully paid in full yet. Do you know what your balance is? I want to say about maybe seventeen or $1,500. What is your monthly payment to the board? $100 a month. And do you recall when you began making those payments? I made my first payment on April 20th for $125. And then every payment after that is $100 a month. And was that a, a 2017 or 2018 that you began? I believe it was 2018. That's okay. If you use your memory, do you feel like you've been making those payments for more than a year? Yes. Okay. Since April of uh, 18. All right. Thank you. Dr. Kawaguchi, I jumped in on you. Do you have any further questions? Actually, I think this is a question for our... our um, Mantle? Yeah, so if we decide to grant this request, 
will we be able to continue to get the payments for cost recovery? Actually, I'm going to I'm going to stop you. Um, Ms. Mantle is not the right person to ask for okay. that. You have board counsel for that, and we can also discuss that in closed session. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Mr. Morodani. Yes, good morning. Um, so I, I just want to understand some of the documents that you submitted. The employee appreciation notice, is that something that Costco um, sends to you or gives to you? Yes, it's something um, that is uh, set aside. If members um, are appreciative of your service, they have a tell us what you think box. And when you get so many submitted at a time, um, you will be recognized um, by managers and they sign the appreciation notes and it goes into your file. And so these were something I submitted just to, to show what my character is at work. And I, I see that it's signed by your supervisor, but other people have kind of signed it, signed them at the bottom. Who are these other? Those are other managers of different departments throughout the warehouse. Okay. Um, and it's a bl bit blurry um, on your employee of the month. Um, I, I, it's, it's noted somewhere else, but r remind me, when did you receive the employee of the month? Uh, that was in August. Okay. Um, August of? Uh, 2018. Okay. Um, and I know you've served a significant number of hours of community service already. Yes. Um, can you remind me how many hours of community service you've already um, done? A ball, a ball bar. I've got 130 hours. <laughs> okay. Um, I have no further questions. All right. Dr. Wang, any questions? Uh, no questions. All right. Ms. Seamantle, do you have any questions for Ms. Savage? Yes, thank you. Regarding your criminal convictions, you were drinking at an office party the night that you were arrested. Is that correct? It was an after work party at a co-worker's house, yes. Your current warehouse manager that you spoke about previously, was she present at that party? No. When you woke up at the hospital after the collision, did you tell the officer that you did not recall anything that occurred previously regarding the collision? Um, I had very not a good recollection of what had happened. Um, I do rem be, remember being removed from a uh, police vehicle when arriving at the hospital. Um, and sitting in a waiting room, um, and yes, other than that, I didn't really recall the crash. Was that due to your level of intoxication? I believe so. Are you still on criminal probation? Yes. Are you on criminal probation until January, January 4th of 2021? Yes. Are you required to abstain from alcohol as a condition of your probation in the criminal case? No. That was a term that was for a year. Um, I completed DUI uh, court for that, and then they sent a form um, deleting that abstention order, which I included. Do you have a sobriety date? Um, I have not ever had any issues with alcoholism or anything like that. Um, this was a terrible accident, um, but I, I've never had previous issues. So. so would you say you do not have a sobriety date then? I guess no. attend any AA or NA meetings? No. Why is that? I, like I said, I don't have a, an alcoholism um, problem. I do go to counseling with um, a therapist though. Do you go to see a therapist regarding any issues with alcohol? No.
you volunteer with the Hope Chest, is that right? Yes. What do you do while volunteering with the Hope Chest? Um, usually sorting uh, different goods that have been donated, um, putting them in place, uh, helping customers with questions. Um, um, it's really kind of like a retail store, I would say. As part of your condition of probation, you're required to do the eight hours of community service regarding the free non-lens dispensing or professional lens dispensing services. Is that right? Can you say that one more time? As part of your condition of probation with the board, you're required to do community service of free non-lens dispensing or professional lens dispensing services on a regular basis. Is that correct? Yes. Where do you perform that community service? Okay, I'm sorry. I think I misunderstood because um, I don't do non. I don't. I don't do optionary work as a um, community service. I submitted for approval from um, the board to complete community service at the Hope Chest and was approved. When you submitted your request to the board, did you specify what you would be doing at the Hope Chest or did you just request to complete community service at the Hope Chest? Um, I'm not certain. Your arrest related to this conviction from October 31st of 2015. Have you consumed alcohol since that time? No. You said, I'm sorry, you said since my accident? since the uh, collision that was a part of the criminal conviction in your accusation case. Um, I'm going to take that statement back because I, afterwards, with the abstention that was lifted from my um, original court, I did have a glass of wine with my neighbor once, so once. <laughs> Around October of 2017, do you recall speaking with the Deputy Attorney General who was handling the accusation matter? Yes. Do you recall telling her that you still consume alcohol, but you will get a ride when you do? She asked me how I thought that I could not have this happen again in the future and um, had asked if I had consumed alcohol, like I stated right now, um, I had with my neighbor. She said if I was going to drink, what would be, how would I know for sure that this wouldn't happen and I said that I would get a ride that they had many um, uh, avenues now like Lyft and Uber that provide ride services. If the board terminates your probation do you intend to continue or to resume drinking alcohol? No. Since you submitted your petition application, have you been convicted of any criminal offenses? No. I have no further, no further questions. All right. Once more, I'll come to the board if anyone has any questions. Dr. Turtsky? No questions. Uh, Ms. Ruby Garcia? No questions. All right. Uh, Dr. McIntyre? No questions. All right, Dr. Kawaguchi? None. All right, Mr. Moridami? No questions. <laughs> and Dr. Wing? No questions. All right.
With that being said, I will give each of you an opportunity to make a closing statement if you would like. Miss um, Savage, you do have the burden of proof, so I'll let you speak last. Miss Seamantle, is there anything that you would like to add? No, thank you. All right. Miss Savage, this is your final opportunity. You are under oath to speak to the board and ask them what it is you'd like to have done in this case. I would like to thank all of you for being here and giving me the opportunity to um, speak. Um, and um, I would appreciate careful consideration um, that this was a one-time event for me, and I've learned just so much um, in this time. And I feel like I, um, I have been made better by this situation, even though it's been a very difficult thing to go through. Um, and thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'll take us off the record. Um, and we'll take the matter as submitted. If you just wait one moment, our court reporter is going to give you a copy of the court reporter billing detail sheet. If you should ever want a copy of this uh, transcript from today's hearings, it has the contact information for our court reporter. Okay? Would you like to immediately go into closed session? Yeah. All right, so we're going to uh, immediately go into closed session, so we're going to kick everybody out. On the record, I think, do I need to close out of closed session and go back into open session or just go back into open session? Back into open session. I think we uh, ended partially through uh, agenda item 12, which was the executive director's report. I think there are a few more items that the executive director wanted to report to. So why don't we continue with item 12? Yes, so we will move to item 12C, um, our legislative and regulatory report, and I'll defer to uh, Mr. Mark Johnson, who prepared the report for us to talk, talk with us about the legislation and uh, packages we're doing at this time. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to get our projector back up here. <clears throat> Can we get our projector back? Yes. Do you want to skip to another item while we wait? or? I think we can still talk through. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, the 2019 legislative session uh, has concluded on September 13th. Uh, it's year one of a two-year session. Uh, the legislature is scheduled to reconvene uh, on January 6, 2020. Um, based on actions that this board has taken in the last uh, year, uh, we're tracking the following bills, which I'll just give you a quick update on. Obviously, our big one is AB 458, uh, Autonomous Home Residence Permits. Uh, we are the sponsor. Um, as most of us probably know, it was signed into law uh, and won't be effective on January 1st, 2020. Um, we are, uh, as staff, we are beginning to uh, develop regulations implementing the bill. It's very preliminary discussions that we've had. Um, and we will be working to present these regulations um, sometime in 2020 and early 2020 uh, to, I guess, probably the Consumer Protection Committee and uh, begin work on implementing that. Um, uh, any questions on the bill? or Just our intention would be that we would bring some initial um, thoughts to the board, uh, hopefully to open up discussion, and uh, then bring through Consumer Protection Committee for initial review, um, and then through Ledge Reg Committee back to the board for final review. Any comments by board members? I will say that I received some uh, really positive comments from some optometrists. Uh, one of them was a person who had uh, testified before us, a professor at UC Berkeley. Um, uh, another optometrist at the UCSF who had had an enforcement action against him to tell him to stop doing um, in-home care. And they were very happy and, in fact, ecstatic that this bill had been Sponsored by the board and signed by the governor. So, good job, guys. Okay. 
Uh, second bill uh, is Assembly Bill 613 by Assemblymember Lowe uh, regarding uh, regulatory fees. This was uh, a bill that uh, was held in committee. I uh, uh, don't know if it'll be taken up again next year. Uh, it was a relatively simple bill that will allow the board to increase to do a small increase of fees um, tied to the CPI and CPI index every four years um, without having to go through any statutory or regulatory um, steps to do it. Um, but it did get held, so um, we'll see if it gets resurrected next year. Um, the third bill is AB 896, um, dis uh, Dispensing Opticians Fund, Optometry Fund, you know, combining uh, the optometry and optician funds together. Um, at the last minute, um, there were some amendments uh, slipped in on August the 30th, uh, which added uh, a number of provisions specific to extended optometric uh, clinical facilities to mean uh, trailers, vans, things like that. Uh, the amendments would limit that ownership to charitable organization, uh, would limit them only to accepting Medi-Cal payments, and then um, would also have some other various functions. Um, this is another bill, AB 896, that, uh, as you may remember, we sponsored. Uh, we did obtain an author, Assemblymember Lowe, for this bill. And um, at the last minute, kind of very last minute, um, the amendments were inserted. Uh, and um, since obviously since our board had not taken a position on the bill on 896 with those amendments, we uh, did not um, uh, we did not go any further with discussions about that with the author or anything. So um, the bill was um, held in the Senate Rules Committee. And uh, I'd probably defer to Shara for a little more, any other background that she might want to provide because I know she's talked to some folks. And we'll continue to talk with us in the Lowe's office. And I think that they're, um, it made it clear during our August board meeting, um, and probably should be better noted, um, the board's uh, support for the concept of mobile vision, particularly around um, sensitive populations, be it children or seniors, uh, and in charitable uh, instances. Um, and so we'll continue to work with uh, vision to learn and other stakeholders to find a way in which um, we might craft a bill that will allow the board enough time to develop a thoughtful regulatory framework um, and then have that regulatory package reviewed. Um, and so we'll continue those conversations and hope that we'll have more concrete data and um, a little more engagement and vision to learn. We hope that they'll they'll come to the table and, and talk with us um, so that we might have some substance to bring back to the board before the end of the legislative um, session, end of legislative year. Uh, it, it is still, though, separately a priority for us to um, merge the optometry and optician refunds um, and so we are working talking both with Assemblymember Lowe about the opportunity to move that provision of the bill forward um, but then also with uh, DCA legislative unit and DCA executive um, about the uh, opportunity for a bill separate from 896 with an urgency that would allow us to merge those funds before the beginning of the next fiscal year. Again, as we mentioned earlier, in order to give us the operational flexibility that we need to meet the needs of our uh, application peaks. And it should, it should just additionally be noted that, you know, we are the sponsors of AB 896, but the, the, our sponsorship was limited to merging the two funds. So when the, 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 the complexion of the bill changed, everything kind of changed for us you know, with these minutes being inserted. And it was all very last minute. Is this what they call hijacking a bill? You could. Question. Um, with the, the new language that's been added here, does would this have any effect on 3070.1? Or is this will this just be its own little... Explain me more in what regard and how does it sit within 3070.1? Well, it, it doesn't sit within 3070.1, right. but just like um, just like the uh, the in-home care bill is tied into 3070.1, some of the some of the issues there is this going to end up being in 3070.1, or is this does this fall more into specifically mobile optometric facilities? 
We've yet to have clear discussions with VTL about the additional provisions here. So I, I hate to say yes or no, um, because we haven't had a conversation about how this bill should be fleshed out. Um, I, we hope that they will engage in discussion with us so that we have a better idea beyond this very loose framework um, of how this might be drafted. Um, so we're hoping, again, that we can have those discussions and that we'll be able to bring you more concrete information about what other changes and uh, more fully what this program would look like. Law, law of unintended consequences. That's just my concern. So this was this a gut and amend? It, it looks like it was kind of gut and it, none of the None of the provisions about, none of the provisions pertaining to the fund mergers were removed. It was the insertion of new language around uh, mobile vision care for charitable organizations. Okay, thanks. And I just wanted to confirm, we don't have a current position. Like, we don't, where we left, where we left this is we didn't have a position on this, correct, as a board? Well, we, correct. The, there was a discussion amongst the board about, in concept, the support for mobile optometric services, um, an understanding that the time frame given to us in 1714 wouldn't allow for introduction of a regulatory package um, and did not uh, give uh, leeway to the board to continue any of its current enforcement investigations. Um, and uh, so there was no, pro no position taken and, and staff was careful when these provisions in 1714 were inserted into 1896. Staff was careful not to speak on behalf of the, on behalf of the board because there was not a position. Uh, it was the feeling of the board or a, a tone of, I believe, comments that in concept this is something that works towards the board's goal of greater access for comp um, comprehensive eye care for, uh, particularly for students. Okay. Uh Fourth bill that we were uh, tracking was Assembly Bill 1467 by Salas and Lowe uh, regarding optometrist scope of practice delegation of services agreement. Uh, we had a watch position on this bill. Uh, this bill was held in the Business Professions and Edu uh, Economic Development Committee uh, and has not been moved on. This uh, bill would authorize an optometrist to provide services uh, set forth in a delegation of services agreement between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist, therefore uh, expanding the optometry scope of practice. Um, the uh, California Optometric Association had been working on this bill. Um, I don't think they're here to give us an update, but um, uh, they're, it's my understanding they're going to continue to work on this and discuss with the various stakeholders uh, to move the bill forward at some point. Uh, the fifth bill was Senate Bill 53 by Wilk, uh, open meetings. Uh, the bill uh, was held in a Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, this bill uh, modifies the Open Meetings Act to require two two-person advisory committees to be public meetings. That so they would have to be publicly noticed. They would have to have um, they'd, they'd have to be open to the public. Um, we took an opposed position on this bill, uh, just because it it would obviously make the board's sort of day-to-day -day functionality very difficult. Um, unclear if the board's gonna, if this bill is going to come out again. It's actually this is the third or fourth year that Senator Wilk has tried to move this bill forward and he has not gotten anywhere, so it's unclear if it's going to come back again next year. Did any other boards uh, oppose the bill? I recall the Board of Accountancy took an opposed position. We took one. I was Accountancy, told at the time. Nursing. Okay. I believe acupuncture did. Um, I believe VBS did. A number of other boards and bureaus did, yeah. Other, other boards, yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, regulatory update. Um, we're currently working on five primary regulatory issues. Um, we talked a little bit about AB 2138, uh, which uh, implements, uh, re which relates to uh, denial of applications, revocations, and suspensions of licensures and cr criminal convictions and how those are used. Um, this package is actually with the uh, DCA uh, director's office. Um, so far, we've got nothing but positive comments, um, uh, so it should be probably given to OAL, I'd say, in the next one to two months. Uh, it will be publicly noticed. We'll have a 45-day comment period on the package, and then um, if there's no comments, then hopefully it would go forward and we can meet the um, statutory implementation date of July 1st, 2020. 
Um, we are, our board is a little more ahead of the game than some of the other boards that are doing the same regulations. Um, so uh, we're, we're pushing forward with that one. Uh, the second one is implementation of AB 443. Uh, allowing optometrists to administer immunizations. Uh, we will be talking about this shortly uh, as part of agenda item nine. Um, number three, optometry disciplinary guidelines, uh, which is our 29, 29, uh, 2019 uh, disciplinary guidelines update. Um, we will be talking about this as part of agenda item 10 shortly. Uh, the fourth is the dispensing optician disciplinary guidelines. Um, the uh, DOC committee uh, review the latest version of the March 15th meeting. Um, we staff has been working internally to update those guidelines, incorporate those changes, uh, add in some other changes. Um, and um, we are uh, likely going to be presenting them to the DOC in December and uh, should be able to move forward with those uh, to the full board, hopefully sometime early next year. Um, uh, yeah. And then the fifth is um, Continuing education regulations, um, the Practice and Education Committee has been, this has sort of been an on and off issue for the last year or so. Um, we are continuing staff work on developing those regulations. Um, we are hoping to have uh, potential changes in draft language to the PEC Committee um, next year in the spring. And that's my report. Do we have any questions or comments by board members? One. So on that last item, uh, that, that is related to us changing optometrists continuing education that it can be more online, is that correct? That is a portion of that, yes. So there, there, this has, as Mark mentioned, and I think in, in meaning to allude to, um, a conversation that's gone on probably over the last two years that started with a, rec a need to recognize uh, the greater availability of online courses and a uh, willingness to allow practitioners to use those courses to uh, uh, have more hours to uh, uh, toward their, their final credits. But then in the last year, we've also had some additional conversations um, about the need to better uh, recognize uh, web content or uh, web disseminated content that has uh, an interactive portion that then could potentially be seen as live credit rather than web-based or, or uh, webinar credit. Um, there's also a need to clarify the um, provisions around uh, the applications um, sent by providers and then also the um, uh, uh, process by which those applications are sent in order to make sure that we don't have folks who are um, teaching courses that are in process of, of being accepted by the board and practitioners are out thinking that they're getting credit for it when in fact a, 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 it has not been approved by the board. So uh, changing the regulations to make it clear that you can't advertise something that we haven't decided is actually going to be board certified um, continuing education. Is there, is, so is there an absolute necessity to bundle all those things together? Or can we separate out so that we can get to the increase in online CE faster? I, I understand the question. Um, it, really just taking into account the need for the regulatory process are separating out the simple hours from uh, you know, this additional package, I, I don't think gives us an opportunity to move things any, any more quickly. Um, we are, you know, as Mark just went through, you know, the four things ahead of this particular package and what's moving through and our need to then notice, then do public hearings, then come back with revisions. Um, I believe that we can, in, you know, the next few months, come back to what the Practice and Education Committee has asked um, for us to research and be able to early next year um, bring to you a, f a full regulatory package that comes at CE at one one chunk. Okay. Mark? Yes. Frosty. So, sure. Um, this whole conversation started, what, two and a half, three years ago? We've already made the one, I remember we took our first baby step, and tell me if this is in place now. It was 20 units of, of correspondence or online CE. It's up to 25 now, isn't it? 
So it is still within regulation that it is 20. And so I, thought, I thought we changed that and the regs were, were adopted and it went up to 25. I'm not aware of a regulatory package that cleared regarding the increase to CE hours. Remember it, Lillian? Yeah, I, I thought... Yeah. I, I thought we had approved it. And we that approved it, it and there was a reg packet. Sure. This was back when Jessica... But I went and I checked the website, and the website still says 20. Still but says I, 20? I, it was my understanding that we had passed it, and... We passed it. And we passed it. I thought the... I thought it went... Through. Yeah, and it was, it was a big stink, and I remember that there were the people who would be financially impacted by this, the schools, the COA, were like, no, 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 and everybody sort of said, okay, 25 is okay. And that, I, I, I could have sworn that went through, and we had a reg packet on that. So we have found within our archive files um, several projects that were begun by staff but did not make its way through the actual regulatory review pro pro process. Um, and I'm not sure that the things that we have, that that list actually includes that 25, that increased to 25. Um, but we have been, we are aware that there are things that were sort of on the back burner, um, but have not been priority over 2138 or the things that are here. Um, but we can bring back to um, the board that list of sort of in progress projects that didn't actually end up in a real regulatory language that got anywhere in the review. Because oh, we're, we're going back a ways at this point. Yeah. That's, that's two and a half, three years back. Yeah. All right, so to whom do we assign blame? <laughs> You're assigning us to look into it. <laughs> Maybe yeah. we can see where we are with DCA if it has gone through the first level uh, if, of review and then so if we're able to pick it up. If, if that never, so the board voted on that, they approved it, mm -hmm. and now there's no regs. If we're going to start talking about allowing all 50 units to be online, does it make any sense to even keep moving forward with uh, going up to 25? So if that's sort of the, in, in line with the comment that I was making. I don't think that we're getting to um, all 50 can be online. That doesn't seem to be the, the tenor of the comments among the Practice and Education Committee. But as I said, that there is a, a, a need to determine whether or not web delivered content with interactive portions should be counted as live. And so I think that that will, of course, change how you see that 25 or that 20 hour. Um, so I think that our need to do, continue to do staff work on sort of best practices within digital technology education delivery um, and the ways in which you can ensure interactive content and what we can do in order to make sure that folks are actually in the seats doing the coursework. Um, I think we can we can get ourselves through that and have for you a regulatory package, whether it's we're coming back to DCA with more stuff than what was submitted to them before, or we're coming to DCA with something new that they haven't seen before that didn't get baked. I think we're, we're looking at early spring, we're bringing all this in one package. So, okay, so let me go back to my earlier question because the things that you're discussing, so the things that PEC may be discussing, which I haven't heard them discussing this, is to be tagging along more regulatory changes that we have not as a board discussed and finalized. And so I, I would challenge back that we're asking for a very straightforward regulatory change to happen, and I don't want the potential complications of the other things you're talking about as far as uh, controlling what defines things, because we already have current definitions. And maybe they do need to change, but I'm, I'm worrisome that if we start tackling that as well, that we are going to find that we are not going to be ready by spring of 2020. Because that may have been what started happening to Dr. Toretzi's point a couple of years ago. So could we, could we as a board have a discussion about this on, on do we really want an encompassing regulatory package for CE or, or would we ask staff to simplify it down to what we had originally asked for possibly two years ago? 
I just in, in, I want to make sure that um, it's clear that we have worked really closely with Dr. Chala um, on the agendas for the practice and education committee and the staff research that we've done. And so I, I think that, that you know possibly there is a conversation to be had, but I, I hate to have that here today without her here um, to discuss what her reasoning has been or her thought process and the way in which the committee has moved forward with those. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that that's the determining factor, but I, I want to make sure that we have her input as that we have um, worked with her over the last year as I've been here um, to look at continuing education and how we should attack this. Um, well, it, it's it's not only about the PEC committee, because this is a regulatory change that we're seeking, so it's it's technically, in my opinion, should be a part of the Ledge Reg Committee. Right, well, the PEC committee two and a half, three years ago, we had started talking about what constituted live CE and how we had to take into account technology and digital seminars and because there was that whole concept of how we felt that it was necessary to have like actual interaction between between ODs and when they go to these continuing education seminars. So this, this discussion has, we've had it several times, at least in the Practice and Education Committee, but the 25 hours that was online CEs was sort of defined as how we're doing online CE currently. But there was definitely, we've, we've, the last two years we've been having conversations about what, what consists of live CE and how emerging technology is going to change our definition of it. So, I mean, I think with with Shara and staff, and what you're investigating right now is is something that we we obviously have to address. But um, but to like Dr. Tresky's point, I thought the 25 hours was was something that we had already passed and it was set. So it looks so. like at the it looks like at the August 3rd, 2018 meeting, it was that and that and some other regulatory packages were presented to the board for approval and it looks like they were approved, but then obviously the next step is for staff to file the rulemaking package with OEL, go through the DCA process and everything, which was not done partially because we went through a transition in staff and EO at the time. So with that comment then, so that means that we do have a package that we could move forward with because we've already approved it, correct? Yes. For the specific 25 hour CE online. Yes. I, 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 I want to, I think, just, there have been at least three discussions with MPEC and my time with the board about the need to um, change regulation around continuing education. And so I just want to um, be thoughtful about the fact that, you know, we, we don't have Dr. Charlie here with us to um, discuss how that conversation has continued to evolve. Um, I think that, you know, we can certainly go back to see what we've got from that August meeting um, and uh, begin to prepare that. Um, I, I just I, I yeah, just want to make sure that we're, we're allowing her an opportunity to, to speak into uh, what her thought process had been and how we were uh, uh, looking at all of this as a whole. It's, it's unfortunately my recollection that n neither, well, I know that Dr. Wong and I are no longer on PEC anymore, so we don't know what happened at the last meeting. Um, Dr. Kawaguchi, is your concern that the old action by the board will change, is, is above and beyond or limiting what the PEC is working on now? Because I, I get the sense that you want whatever online regulations to happen sooner rather than later and not wait for anything else. Is that is that my, my understanding? That's correct. Because okay. we as a board voted and decided on something and if there's additional things that's fine but if something's already been decided upon I don't know that we should be adding and postponing without the board's understanding and approval of that. So I understand what you're saying, Shara, but we as a board had already voted and decided to move the 25 hour forward. And if there's additional things that have been uncovered since then, I, I can understand that. And they should come back to the board and it could be a separate package if it need, needs to be. All right, let me, I, I think this is gonna require staff to look back and see what was adopted by the board a couple years ago, whenever that happened, 
and see whether that comes before item five. It's pro it should be processed before item five. Could we also instruct staff to then, if they're going to do that, look into what other states are considering live CE? So, because there are a lot, I don't know. So I no, that's, 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 I mean, that is the staff research that we were charged with by PEC that we're okay. yes. in the process right. of doing. Yes. So since Mark and I aren't <laughs> on the committee anymore, I don't know what you guys are. When, when we did the 25 units, mm -hmm. the staff, staff had already researched a number of other states. Um, and we had all that data on file. Well, I think they researched how many online hours other states could. Right. right. But I think what the... But the issue now is with technology, what's considered a live CE and how much interactive CE, how much, how interactive CE can be now. So, I mean, even in the last year, things have changed a significant amount. So I think if staff is actually looking into seeing what other states consider live CE, or mm -hmm. that, that would be interesting okay. to me. So, so we're, we're, we're largely shooting in the dark right now, I think. So I think staff needs to research this have a conversation with the chair of the PEC committee. I get the sentiment, at least from a, at least a couple of members of the sitting board today, that they want to make sure that online CE be approved sooner than later. I, I think that's all, all, all you can take from this right now. OK. Um, any, uh, any other comments by more members on the regulatory package? I just have one, um, one question. When I was on the uh, Consumer Protection Committee, I recall there was some discussion about the optometry disciplinary guidelines in relation to the dispensing optician disciplinary guidelines. I originally thought we were going to do the, pass the, dis, the optician first and then have the optometry follow on. Uh, I see the orders change. I'm okay with it. I just want to make sure I understand what's, what, what, how, why the orders changed. I wouldn't say the order has changed. We're working on it. It's just for the purposes of listing it, we're working on it both simultaneously. Okay, although the optometrist discipline guidelines are on the agenda today for discussion, right? Um, I'm okay with that. I'm just. All right. I, I just know <laughs> it. I just. And I am sure you'll explain when we get to the optometry disciplinary guidelines. All right. There, I'm. Um, yes, right. <laughs> I, I guess my only concern is that we, you know, if we approve the opt optometrist disciplinary guidelines, and something different happens with the optician, I want to don't want to have to go come keep going back and forth, right? So I think that in at least my time with the board, uh, because we had disciplinary guidelines don't currently exist for opticianry program. Yes. So really and truly we were looking at doing the review of the optometry guidelines to get us to sort of up to date to where we wanted to be. And what we've done is set that aside our practice act for opticianry and looked at how we could move that there. So I don't know if there was a change in possibly, you know, in the last year as things have changed, um, a way in which staff had intended to previously uh, address the, the project, but for current staff, it made sense to take what we had where we were farther along in the process to understand what the board wanted to do with that and then use that as a, a model for how we would develop the whole new guidelines. And so that's how we've proceeded. That makes sense. <laughs> um, why don't we move on to the next agenda item, which is what? Oh, staff update, yes, which is in your, in your in the staff update. So uh, we have had a, a good deal of um, change in our staff. Uh, we are happy to have recently made uh, an offer to Ms. Kimball. Um, she is our acting assistant executive officer, and with the processing of paperwork, will be our full-time permanent assistant executive officer in the next few weeks, and we're very excited to have her in that role. Uh, she has been a fantastic uh, resource to me and I know to all the board members as well. Her 10 years uh, on the board and enforcement and has been uh, instrumental in our understanding of how we can move forward and really in how we're looking at process changes in our licensing unit and our administration unit. And so we're glad to have Sheree finally uh, formally in our management team. Um, and then also you all had um, the opportunity to meet Tian Lee, who is our uh, 
Cardinal, <laughs> our uh, coordinator with uh, one of our coordinators within the Optician League program, who is backing up Ms. Swan at this point for our administrations um, and uh, learning some of the, the overarching board uh, uh, workings. Um, and then at the end of the month, on the 28th, actually, so it's probably the next business day, uh, Michelle uh, Shabir will begin as our um, front office receptionist or uh, office technician and comes from um, a few different state offices and so we're excited to have that position filled. We'll of course then be backfilling our enforcement officer uh, and backfilling our uh, optician and program licensing uh, position. So we'll continue to see some new faces, but we're excited that folks um, are using the expertise they gain in first positions and then moving through to continue and elevate the operations of the board. Any comments uh, by the board or questions regarding the staff report? I just want to thank Jessica for the job she's done for us and the time she's been in her position. Yes. Agreed. Anybody else? You, you Any will other? be missed. Ruby, did you want to say something? No, I just want to thank her as well. Yes. Um, I just want to say, um, if it's not evident from the executive director's report, our executive director has been um, has been doing a great job at juggling. Mm -hmm. um, she's been, of course, running our programs, but also in numerous interviews, interviewing for staff to um, replace the people who are being promoted, leaving, entering, um, as well as, as you know, that our executive director is, how long have you been here? A year. A year. So she's still in the process of going through trainings. Halloween will be my year. <laughs> lots of trainings. So um, she has adeptly most of the time, <laughs> yeah. I juggle a lot of balls in these past few months. I think we, we told her that she'd be coming into the fire. <laughs> right? All right, next item is um, the disciplinary guidelines. Uh, we can move through the, oh. the uh, agenda as originally planned. All right, very good. So just having the item seven? The calendar. Yes, we'll go back up. Seven. Yep, definitely. So this is the second opportunity uh, that we've taken to look at the calendar. We made it clear that we appreciate the uh, form that we have of Friday meetings uh, in your calendar in your packet. We have the suggested calendar for 2020. This includes the quarterly meetings um, as well as committee meetings and the dispensing statutorily required dispensing optician committee meetings. Uh, we have, of course, taken a look at um, the legislative calendar, taken a look at our sunset review calendar, which also, of course, begins next year, as well as our strategic planning calendar, um, and so have chosen these dates um, in order to allow us public comment and uh, uh, healthy discussion uh, regarding all of those statutorily required <laughs> uh, uh, objects of their uh, objectives of the board. Actually, I'm sorry. On the last item, do we have to take public comment or not? No. No. Oh. On the executive director's report. It, not it, it hurts to ask, but if you haven't taken action on something, right, you're not right. required to call for it. But just in case, does anyone want to speak to any of the items on the executive director's report? All right. Sorry for that interruption. Okay. We're on the calendar. All right. So we have dates, and if there we have um, solicited input from the board, um, if there are changes that need to be made, we would discuss them now <laughs> and see if we can make accommodations. Dr. Turetsky? Uh just just a thought. Um, February 2020, we're talking about possibly San Jose. October 2020, we're talking about Monterey or Fresno. If we're doing San Jose, that's within an hour and 15 minutes of Monterey. It's sort of if we're going to travel, it might as well be a little further away, farther away. Um, and Fresno would just, Fresno would be great. I, the, you know, beautiful scenery, it, 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 that's, that's the place to go. Hey, gar gateway to Yosemite. Yeah. So um, that would be better than if we're choosing Monterey, if we're already going to do San Jose. So our intention, we're giving ourselves a little bit of leeway. The travel to Fresno, of course, is tough um, for staff and for board members. Um, it is something we like to do. The board hasn't met in the Central Valley in many years. Right. Um, we're, 
the train. Well, yes, but it is. No, no, no. It, that is. It's. It's the 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 train is what, likely what staff would use and what we would uh, work in in order to allow board to attend. But we're still working on the cost of that and the logistics of that. So we are open to, and I think more than willing to look at whether or not if we're not able to make Fresno happen, then you know Monterey might not be the best idea since we're in San Jose, looking at maybe doing another LA location um, that or Southern California location uh, that would spread us out. Okay. Any other comments? So I have a I have a comment about meeting start times um, for us to be able to consider fluctuation of the start time. Um, because one of your earlier comments at our last meeting, Shara, was um, looking out for the budget related to travel costs. And um, depending on the content of a meeting and the expected length of the meeting, I think that we could vary the start time and that would help with travel costs. So for example, um, if today's meeting, if we had started literally half an hour later, I wouldn't have had to incur overnight stay. And so um, I want staff to, to take a look at what the agenda is looking like and make a suggestion to our president about start time so that we can be mindful of the travel costs. Thank you, and we certainly do. Um, coming from uh, you know executive travel background myself, um, looking at whatever flights we can get on and what's the contingent flight you can get in on the morning. Um, this particular meeting, because we were going on the ALJ um, and having that particular hearing, we were a little more set in once we had brought in um, our uh, uh, ALJ and the court reporter for that. But we certainly do with each meeting take a look at the amount of uh, material that will need to be reviewed, uh, take a look at the schedules of when folks can get back and start their weekend, as we know folks often like to do, um, and then try to accordingly set the start time so as to allow those who are coming in uh, by car travel or those who might catch an early morning flight to attend without having to do an overnight stay. But it's certainly something that we will continue to, to evaluate uh, for our 2020 meetings. Any other comments? Do we need a vote on this, or should we just move forward? All right. <laughs> and then in that case, if you're going to vote on it, then you would call for public comment before the vote is taken. All right. Um, now, uh, procedurally, if we vote on it and approve it, but you need to make changes to it, do we have to bring it back to the board? Not the full. We'll come back to you and just let you know, hey, we've decided that Fresno is going to be too expensive or we're not able to find the location. So we've determined in June that our October meeting will, in fact, be in So I think that, that suggests to me that you wouldn't want to take a vote on it. You would want to just let your staff know that you're to go ahead and move forward and then make changes as necessary, All right. sounds like. I, I, I'd okay. prefer to do that. Uh, although I welcome any public comment for those of you of who are no. planning on attending the, these meetings. All right, uh, hearing nothing, uh, let's move on to the next agenda item, okay. which is, um, I believe, minutes? Yes, minutes. Do we have any comments, corrections, questions about the minutes? Doc, uh, we'll start on this end. <laughs> no, no comments. Uh, Dr. Kawaguchi? Uh, yes, I do. Let me pull it up. Okay, so let me find it. Okay, so on page three, um, there's a small misstatement about board secretary. We did a vote for board secretary, but it was not a vote for nomination. It was actually a vote for the position. So that okay, in the actual, so below public comments in the actual, Mark Moore, do we move to nominate? It was not a, yeah, it was it a was nomination. nomination. Should that be moved to elect? Yes. Anything else, Glenn, from you? Yeah, so there was, um, and Char, you might have to help me with the bill number, but there was a bill that we had a pretty lengthy discussion about in the legislative, 
legislative, excuse me, regulatory updates. And that doesn't seem to be reflected in the minutes at all. And so I would request um, for staff to return to that section and provide more substance to that section so that the minutes reflect more the flavor of the conversation. So I believe we're discussing AB 1714 and it's page 12 of the memo, the meetings, page 12 of 14, uh, the meeting, I'm sorry, minutes memo, uh, where we begin, uh, Ms. Murphy reported that Vision to Learn has been negotiation, negotiating with uh, California Optometric Association and then continues to the bottom of page 13 of 14. Um, are there particular points that are missing within this summarization of the debate? Um, specifically, I know that we had talked about implementation timelines as it connected to enforcement. And I don't feel like we've reflected anything about enforcement in the text. Glenn, if I can. Inter interrupt yep, you and ahead. ask you a question because um, it pertains to a comment I was gonna, going to make later. Uh, my later comment was going to be I, I thought that the minutes were too detailed and that the staff <laughs> did not have to go into such detail on some of these items. Um, I appreciated uh, in the discussion of SB 53 um, my summary of comments in, in the board's opposition. I recall at the time I, I wanted the minutes to reflect my my comments at the time for that particular bill, but for the other discussions, I thought there, there was too much. So I, I just want to make sure that, and, and I'm, I'm not disagreeing with, with Glenn, because I'm sure Glenn, uh, Member Kalguch, has very good reasons why he wants additional detail on that item, but I, I just wanted to just give you that flavor of, of my later comment. So I will leave it then to my fellow board members to take into consideration what I just raised and whether or not they feel that the uh, explanations of that bill are sufficient to encompass our discussions that day. Okay. Any other comments by board members about the minutes? Dr. Tereski? Um Page 6 of 14, public comment. Yes. Because um, Dr. Lowe is, is not just a respected <laughs> optometrist, but the father it's of the head yes, of the Business it. and it's Professions going to get changed Committee. changed immediately, yes. <laughs> changed Dr. Lowe's name to read L O W. Okay. Any other comments? Um, other than the comment I just made about <laughs> the detail, <laughs> I'll leave it up to the staff's discretion. I don't. You know, we, we do have the, the purpose of the video tape if you want to see testimony. Um, um, you might make a regular practice of kind of doing a word search of my name and make sure it's Mr. Not Doctor. I saw one doctor. And I, I understand it's a very reasonable error to make. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we, we are continuing to trying to strike that balance of enough detail. I think that we err on the side of more detail because we're constantly looking to archive uh, board meeting minutes before our time in order to understand the intent of the board. Um, so we want to first you know, make sure that those in perpetuity will have an opportunity to continue to act on the board's intent. But we are trying to sort of get that nice balance of clear, concise, but this was the intent of the board. Right. All right, hearing no further comment, um, do we have any comment from members of the audience? All right, I will entertain a motion to approve these minutes. I'll make that motion. Um, as amended and discussed today. Yes. Moved by uh, Member Wong. Do I have a second? Second. Approved by Member Garcia. Do we need a roll call? Or can we just do I and A? 
All right, very good. Um, No, how oh. do you want to take the call? You take the call? Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll vote to accept the minutes with whatever edits we made there. Uh, Mr. Mardomi. Oh, aye. Dr. Calgucci. Aye. Ms. Brandvine, not here. Dr. Mike. Oh, turn on your mic. Dr. Tureski. Aye. Dr. Chala, not here. Uh, Ms. Garcia. Aye. Deborah McIntyre, aye. Maria Salazar Sperber, not here. Dr. Wong, aye. Rachel Michelin, not here. All right. Moving on to the next agenda item, is it uh, nine? Nine. Yes. Update discussion and possible action on implementing regulations on Assembly Bill 443. Okay. And Mark will present this item. Johnson. Okay. Um, 443 has uh, been signed into law. Uh, we, the board, had approved the implementation package at the April 5th meeting. Um, we did uh, complete the package, and it was submitted to DCA for uh, approval, which, of course, has to happen before uh, the Office of Ministry of Law can receive it and uh, post it for public comment. DCA legal did return a couple of uh, changes, which um, do require board approval. They're all pretty non-substantiative, but uh, they, because we are changing the text, we uh, need to have you approve them or change them accordingly. Um, so if you could just refer to the second, uh, it's the, probably the third page as part of the item, it's the actual text itself. And uh, the, first, the first change is just uh, uh, to better tie in the, BP, uh, the BPC code to what uh, licensed optometrists. We just added the word licensed in there. Uh, the second change is uh, changing it from changing it to immunization certificate uh, because it, we are just issuing a certificate rather than certifying the training itself. Um, the third change, which uh, council had suggested the board discuss, is just do we want to eliminate on the actual form for the immunization certification the listing of uh, address of record and telephone number. Um, Legal's um, idea was that it would just simply streamline the regulatory process with less to justify and that the license number um, that the optometrist um, uh, puts down is obviously it ties them in anyway. So uh, that would be the first thing that uh, I would ask the board to just think about and discuss real quickly. If we want to keep the uh, address of record and telephone number on the application, or if we can just remove it. So let's go ahead and start with any questions or comments on the left. Dr. Wong? Um, I think all the changes are fine. I don't have any comments. I'm fine. Any more comments on my right side? Dr. McIntyre? No. Ms. Garcia, no. Dr. Krasky. Um, any comments by the public? Oh, I still have a. Oh. I, do you want me to continue pointing out the, the changes? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. I think I think what I'm hearing from from board is that they've read through the memo. They understand the changes required. We will go ahead and strike uh, the address of record and the telephone number. We will include the TPA number so as to tie that to the license as or to tie that to the certificate as well. Um, and the other minor changes for documents proving. And then the other thing, just to quickly note, is that um, because we are changing the text, that our form will also be changed as well to reflect the removal of address and telephone number and such. So just to note that as well. Right. So I, I did have one question. What's TPA certification number? Well, council had said that uh, we issue some kind of TPA certification. So, we, so it's part of the license. So mm -hmm. in the person's license number, it would be number, 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 number. And then TPA, if you're... TLG. And then, so T stands for your ther your TPA. So I think if you say add in the TPA certification number, that's not necessary because that T in your license number is the therapeutic part. So I think as long as you have license number written down, that's more than sufficient. Mark? 
Uh, Dr. Tresky? I, and I don't know if, if you, Mark, would have any knowledge of this. Once this goes through, once it's approved, once the regs are written and everything's done, do you have any idea if this will then become, if immunizations will then become a reimbursable service for optometrists under Medi-Cal? I, I don't. Because like many things that we're allowed to do, Medi-Cal doesn't pay for them. Can we make that part of public comment if COA might know afterwards? Hi, yep. Christine. I've heard, I've heard that if it's a covered service, then uh, it might be reimbursed for a function. But the reimbursement rate is quite low. Yeah, probably won't even pay for the immunization itself. Okay. Any, any other public comment? Any other discussion by the board? Mark, are you ready for a vote? All right, I need a first a motion, and very helpfully there is a suggested motion language in the on the first page of the report. So does anyone move? So I will move to approve both the form with the edits discussed here today, as well as approve the proposed edits to section 1572, title 16 of the California Code of Regulations as discussed here today. Direct staff to resubmit the text to the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs. <laughs> in the business, consumer services, and housing agency for review, and if no adverse comments are received, authorize the executive officer to make any non-substantive changes to the rulemaking package and set the matter for hearing. God, that Glenn. was so well said. <laughs> I'll second Such that very sense. well said motion, Glenn. <laughs> All right, Madam Secretary, could you take the roll for the vote? Oh, uh, unless there's any further comment. Uh, may I suggest, a, first, I may have missed the second. We have a second, I take it. Yeah, we have Thanks. Second. And then a minor refinement, if you could call for public comment before the vote. So after the second and before the vote is taken. After the second and before the vote. Oh, public comment again? Or you can only ask for it then, but the key is to ask for it before action is taken. Oh, I thought I, I thought we did, just had public comment. Before, uh, before, before the act. Oh. Again, it might seem minor, and I know it's a little tweak, so. All right. Um, any further public comment? Hearing none, <laughs> we can take a vote. Mr. Moradomi. Oh, aye. Dr. Kawaguchi. Aye. Ms. Brandvine, absent. Dr. Turetsky. Aye. Dr. Chala, absent. Ms. Garcia. Aye. Dr. McIntyre, aye. Ms. Salazar Sperber, absent. Dr. Wong. Aye. Ms. Michelin, absent. Okay, this passes. Next item is item 10. And that's update discussion and possible action on changes to California Code of Regulations 1575. Those are our or, I'm sorry, optometry disciplinary guidelines, and Sheree will lead our discussion. Okay. Um, so as you know, you guys have seen this a few times. Um, uh, the changes that we have made since the last time that you've seen them are uh, changes that were discussed at the CPC meeting in September of 2019. Um, we've added the updated language for from the SAC guidelines. Um, uh, we've gone through and changed pronouns from he or she or himself or herself to gender neutral pronouns. That's um, a directive that's coming out of the legislature and the governor's office. Um, there was a note at one point we had talked about changing a uh, worksite monitor to practice monitor, but it's listed as worksite monitor in the uniform standards for substance abusing licensees, so we did have to leave it as worksite monitor instead of practice monitor. Um, but I hope that you've had a chance to go over the changes, and if you have questions, I am ready to try to answer them. Okay, do we have any questions by board members? Dr. Tresky. This is, it, this goes for disciplinary actions for, I think, opticians as well as optometrists. But um, page 20 of 57, um, one of the terms of dis disciplinary action from uh, page 20 and 21, that you have to function as an optometrist. What does that mean? 
it, it means that if you are an optometrist and your license is on probation, that you have to work as an optometrist for a minimum of 60 hours per month. Okay, so I spend most of my time, I'm a licensed optometrist, I spend most of my time doing administration and quality assurance issues for my group. Mm -hmm. So that's how I'm functioning as an optometrist. So, so I, if I was on probation, is that considered functioning as an optometrist? I can't really answer that. That's my point. Yeah, well, it's going to be, you know, if I'm, if I'm not spinning dials in a small dark room, mm -hmm. does that mean that I'm no longer functioning as an optometrist? Well, my thought on that would be if I, if the board has placed an optometrist on probation for practice related issues, so say in the course of treating a patient, they failed to diagnose something and that patient lost their vision and the probation that we've put them on is to help them become better optometrists, them not treating patients for the entirety of their probation doesn't really get that done. So um, this is a term that's been part of the disciplinary guidelines for as long as I've been with the board. I, I know. I, I realize that. And I noticed the same thing in the opticians guidelines. It's and, and, and that's part of the reason that we do that is because in order to, uh, if, if there's a, a practice problem with an optometrist, if there's an incompetency or something, them not practicing optometry during their probation doesn't get the rehabilitation and the retraining that we're looking for for that probation. It sounds like if there's a room for more clarity. It, it, well, uh, if, if I'm contacted, my group works in, in skilled nursing facilities. So if I'm contacted by skilled nursing facilities and asked to use my expertise as an optometrist as to how to improve the visual environment for patients suffering with visually challenging um, conditions, I'm functioning as an optometrist. So I'm doing what I do. I'm doing what my license is allowing me to do with a certain level of expertise as part of that license. So I, I you know, if, if, if somebody lodges a complaint against me because I broke somebody's frame when I was adjusting it and I'm going to be cited for frame breakage, does that mean that I have to just function for the three-year probationary term that I'm on, fitting frames on people? It's a stupid question the way I'm, at, I'm wording it, but this, this does not describe all the functions of an optometrist. Um, there's optometrists that do administration. There's optometrists that do nothing but quality assurance functions. Um, Lillian, Lillian does, uh, Dr. Wong does, does instruction in a school. Mm -hmm. right. So This is your opportunity as a board to determine, do you want... I, I think that this that this term needs that, that function needs as an optometrist is 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 so ambiguous that mm -hmm. it really doesn't allow us to make an, a, a judgment when it comes to performing um, or when it comes to disciplinary actions. It needs to be a lot more specific, and it needs to be related to the to the act that the person is being disciplined for. So, let me play lawyer just for a moment here. Um, what you do right now. Right, you don't spin dials, but do you do you think you did, are you required to have an optometry license to do, do what you're doing now? Probably yes. 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 Lillian, when she's not teaching, when, when she's not spinning dials, she's just a teacher, right? But she probably needs to have an optometry license to do it, right? So if you have to have an optometry license to do what you're doing, by definition, you are practicing optometry. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think I, I don't think we need to get into that detail. I think if if the probationary term is you got to keep practicing as an optometrist, if you're doing stuff that you have to be licensed for, you're practicing as an optometrist. So so maybe having the the term being so vague actually is better for interpretation case by case because we can say, hey, even though you're not in a dark room spinning dials, you still need your license and your knowledge and your expertise in order to do quality control. And I still need to I still need to have my knowledge in order to instruct all the students. Okay. So I'm I'm func I'm using my license to teach future optometrists. You're using your license to ensure quality control and 
it's but license what, activity. License activity. But right. what if the person who is monitoring my probation mm -hmm. says, "Well, no, all you're doing is, you know, you're making, you're doing consulting. You're doing, you're using your expertise, but not to see specific patients. And I, as your probationer, want you to be doing eye exams and and dispensing glasses and fitting contact lenses, which." is not what I spend most of my time doing. But wouldn't, wouldn't the board during the hearings or however we set the probation have outlined that? The, 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 when, when the board has the hearing, it's going to say you have to function as an optometrist. Mm -hmm. And that leaves everything that I'm going to do on probation, correct me if I'm wrong, Shuri, wouldn't that leave it up to my probation monitor to decide if I'm functioning as an optometrist? Wouldn't it be up to, to the monitor to make that decision? Or couldn't it have been discussed during the hearing, saying, well, you function as an optometrist for... A, a lot of these things are, are done in front of, a, a, of an ALJ or citations issued or something like that, where, where we're never, right. we're never going to be part of that decision. Right, to that point, this is your message to the ALJs. This is your notice to them to say, here's what to apply. So they wouldn't uh, necessarily go beyond that, and they would include it. I, I, I really think that before we, we adopt this as, as done and over, mm -hmm. we should wordsmith this a little bit better. And, and, and today might not be the right time to do it, but I just think it needs to be wordsmithed a little bit, a little bit better than just saying function as an optometrist. If, you're, if you as a board are in a position where staff has been implementing that in a way that, that has worked, and they have the room to do that and the discretion, and there hasn't been a problem, then maybe it's not an issue. If your goal is to get more specific because it, you want it to be clear that that's the kind of practice they're definitely engaging in, then that's the then then there's room to add that clarity. I, I, I really don't know. That I mean, that's why I bring this up. It just. I think this does come back to the probation monitor. I think th there are two things, right? That if your general functions are not patient care, it's not likely that your violation is, is, is in respect to patient care. You're probably going to continue to go back to the duties that you've held before and that got you in trouble. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm not sure that if that that we'll, we'll ha we have that sort of of that sort of. of, of contradiction or issue, um, and then I think that, it, that it, if we put too fine a point on it, then we don't allow the probation monitor to be sure that in this instance, the practice is in order to give the practitioner an opportunity to get better at what wasn't practiced well before. So I worry that if we do that, if we do put a finer point on it, I'm not sure how we would do it. That it would in fact tie our hands and make probation terms less applicable to the individual case by case. Can, can, excuse me. Can somebody point me the language that that David you're you're concerned about? It's your top twenty one. Twenty one. All right. Bottom yes. of twenty. Top so, of twenty one. Right. So, so we're going to make a car while so, I'm looking. So Dave. Um, one of the things that I think that we experience when uh, we have professional probationers is in many cases they complain that it's difficult to even get a job in our profession. And I think um, an un unintended consequence if we are overly specific could even limit their ability to function as an optometrist possibly even more. That would be the one fear that I have with what you're discussing. If we're over specific, it could create a, a burden that they can't overcome in their probation. So that's my only thought on that. Um, wait, wait, I have a comment. What, what if it was just something to say as an optometrist treating a patient, anything having to be about treatment of the patient with that. I, I worry there too though that it's too fine a point. If we've got someone who, um, you know, their infraction is not about treatment to a patient but instead about medical, you know, billing fraud or okay. then we have this provision here that says they've got to spend their time treating patients. I worry that if we put too fine a point on it then we make it less applicable to each case of probation. Okay. So, 
what Member Kretzky is pointing out is a little bit different than the probation requirements. I think they're, they're, they're a little bit separate. Um, I, I get your concern about the language because you don't know, you, you don't want, you don't, if it were you, as a, for example, you don't want to be hammered for not functioning as an optometrist. So I think there's language you can, there, there's language you can put in, something like, respondent shall engage in the practice of optometry for a minimum of 60 hours. The practice of optometry, I think, is, is defined in the code, right? So it would just okay. import the, that definition of the practice of optometry. I think that's exactly the issue though, that Dr. Turetsky is mentioning, that then you would very clearly need to be in the dark spinning dials uh, as a function of your function of your probation, but a good portion of your job could be administrative. So I, I think it's the same that if we put too fine a point on it here, then we don't get the opportunity to make it applicable to each individual probation case. But so, uh, that's not what I heard from no, no, David. She's, no, Shara's right. That, that's... So this other stuff you do is not the practice of optometry. I know. I mean, I, I see patients, but that's really that is a minor part of what I do. But again, I, I'm thinking of, of what I do, what somebody who's an instructor in a school does, um, what somebody who, with former board member, um, former vice president of the board, about ten years ago, she works at Kaiser as uh, in in their business development department. So. If we suddenly said, you have to go in and start seeing patients, it's not what she does. Now, granted, she probably wouldn't have done anything which would have caused her to come up for probation, but... I think that's the thing, too, though, in, in uh, you know, practicality, that because you are an administrator, Dr. Turetsky, more than likely your infraction would be something administrative. We'd want you to go back to doing your regular job and do it the right way. So we wouldn't want to prescribe you to suddenly spend dials in a dark room because that's not where you faltered. You faltered in your job as an administrator who has the special expertise and the certificate, the professional licensure of an optometrist. And so we want you to go back and do that, do the things that got you in trouble, but do them the right way. Okay, so let, let's dance on the head of a pin a little longer. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm a chief at Kaiser of, of the optometry department. I'm going to be spending... 80 to 90 percent of my time overseeing the other optometrists and maybe 10 to 20 percent of my time seeing patients. If I'm suddenly told that I'm spending the majority of my time seeing patients, I can no longer do my, my job as the chief of the department. I, I have a question about that. Yeah. In your job as chief of the department for Kaiser, are you working as an optometrist? Sure. You You're overseeing the other optometrists then you're functioning as an optometrist. And, and, but you see, that's, that, you as the enforcement person have made that decision. But you know, uh, we hire a new enforcement person, and that person says, oh no, I want, you, you know, I want you in that room all the time spinning those dials and selling glasses to people. Um, where where would, would the optometrist, the probationer, without having to wait for another board meeting to get on the agenda and all that, where could that person say, hey, this is not what I do? And could they, could they appeal directly to you as the assistant executive officer or to the executive officer or is the person who is in charge of their probation, does, does that person have the final say? Um, the probation monitor would not have the final say if a probationer really felt that their terms were being applied unfairly. They could appeal that to the executive officer or the assistant executive officer and then um, the management team can look into it further and kind of see if there is an opportunity to step in or if um, maybe the probationer is just misunderstanding or the probation monitor um, is misunderstanding. Um, another thing is that none of these terms go into effect until they've come to the board and the board has adopted the decision that has them. So you have the opportunity, if you have a decision in front of you where you feel like this term isn't applicable, that you can reject the decision to have this term taken out. And you're talking about, not, you're not talking about in the guidelines, you're talking about somebody actually yeah, coming like for the board. Yeah, on a case-by-case -case basis. If you have a case in front of you for, for board both, and your reading of it doesn't right. seem to you like this is a fitting 
term, like this is going to be some sort of some... I might, I might step in to refine that just a little because, of course, if you are getting a decision that comes from the ALJ where they've already applied this standard term, you would then theoretically have to reject an entire case just to make any alterations to that. So that, so that, so the ability to fine tune is maybe a little bit lost. So this is your opportunity to send the message to the ALJ of what exactly you'd want in there. And then I think there is something to be said for allowing the discretion for your staff to determine what that means. So <laughs> is that something which can actually be placed in the guidelines subject to staff? staff approval, staff interpretation, something other than just the blanket function as an optometrist and you go to the business profession codes and say, this is what you have to do. Here's what you are if you're an optometrist. That's similar to other places in your uh, guidelines where it might say things like subject to prior board approval and things like that. So, so that might that be what we need to do, explicit. a little asterisk, something like that. Yeah, if the board thinks that would help guide everyone along the way saying, okay, we're applying this standard term. It says function as an opto optometrist or work as an optometrist. Subject to board, subject to board, let's see, I think, um, I'm not sure if it's board staff approval, but you know, without that language, you're doing that already. You're, in other words, you're, you're not, um, that's where you currently are without adding that. It is? Well, yes, because once that term is there, and the order becomes final, and they have that order, and they say, okay, probation monitor, this is my order, what do I do? That is who they go to to make that determination already. If that, so we yeah. could have left 10 minutes earlier, and I didn't have to start Well, we don't have to mention that part, but <laughs> I mean, it's a valid line of questioning to make sure we have the clarity we need, but I think it helps to understand okay, so, that that but, discretion so that in, is in, in your legal opinion, by leaving it, this blanket, it doesn't mean you got to do what it says in the in the ma in, in the business profession code. It leaves it open to, to a lot of discretion. I think what Sheree would confirm is that then that means that that respondent goes back over to boards, probation monitors, and staff and gets confirmation of what that's going to mean. And again, if you're not seeing problems with that approach at the moment, then I think that discretion is probably appropriate. Sheree has anybody in your time on the board as, as an enforcement monitor, has anybody ever complained about that term? The most issue, the, the largest problems that I see for my probationers is people who are having a hard time getting hired as an optometrist with who's on probation. So the getting the work to do the 60 hours a week or 60 hours a month is um, more of a problem for my probationers than what they're doing as an optometrist. Like, what does that look like? It's more getting the job. So okay. then, that, my follow-up question to that then, is that respondent's next course of action, should they not be able to fulfill that to your or executive officer's belief is appropriate, they could appeal their probation. Is that correct? They can petition for modification, but I think they there's could, a okay, um, right. there's a time limit, or there's usually a... Uh, Time frame requirement on that. I think you, I don't know your statute offhand, but I think usually a year before they can do that. So they could. We haven't had that happen, but okay. they could theoretically wait a year and ask for a modification from the board. All right. I I sense that the issue has been sufficient re sufficiently resolved, at least for the time being. Um, this might be an area where you want to take good minutes so that when these questions come up, we can refer, you can refer, we can all refer to the minutes and uh, get a sense of the, get a, we can all remember what the sense of the board was. Sure. All right, any other? Um, yeah, actually, I'd like a, I have a question. I'd like the clarification from the board on, this was just brought to my attention earlier today. On page 22, so the next page over on number 10, community services, the idea of volunteer work. I just want to make sure I'm understanding that term properly. As I read it, it looks like the intent is to say that the probationer would provide either optome optometric or non-optometric services. It sounds like it's both, op they can act either as a doctor for free 
or just do regular community service. That's how I random unrelated community service. If that's the case and that's the intent of this term, which apparently has caused some confusion, maybe it would be helpful to add the word either uh, after after free. free. Yeah. Bef yeah. I think after free, so it's free or it's either oh I see what you're saying, yeah. Free. Or free. free. Exactly. Free. Add another free. So I think that would add clarity, and I think that would achieve the goal that you guys had in mind. All right. Any other further discussion? There was one additional point. Um, if we could move to page 8 of 57, and this comes to the uh, applicability of the um, standard or terms for substance abuse, uh, and in clause B, I would like the board to um, consider the amendment or the addition or edit. Um, if the conduct found to be a violation involves, I would suggest we add the use or abuse of alcohol or drugs, the licensee may be presumed to be a substance abusing licensee for purposes of that section. And I think that that gives us more clarity in some of the discussions we've had around closed session that if um, a doctor is uh, receiving discipline for over prescribing that it might not necessarily be a term or condition that biological fluid testing should occur that person has not been found to be in the use or abuse of drugs or alcohol and so in including the use or abuse of drugs and alcohol we make it clear that those standard terms and condi conditions do not apply to any case or to all cases that might include some sort of prescribing or some sort of uh, uh, drug Did anyone understand that? I understood it. Okay. Uh, I like that comment. Um, any other comments by the board? I have one question I want to highlight, one issue for the board, and that is with the removal of the 30-day suspension language in some of, some of these provisions. And I wanted to raise for thought discussion by the board as to the removal of the 30-day suspension requirement um, it's changed to just suspension um, the argument in favor of making it just suspension without mentioning 30 days is is that it gives the board more flexibility to determine the amount of the, the, the length of the suspension the argument against that um, change is that it allows for suspension of less than 30 days for some of our more egregious possibly egregious violations so um, excessive prescribing um, currently you have you're automatically you're, you're suspended for 30 days uh, or, or, or yeah the the if warranted the suspension is 30 days or more um, you know, I, I, I leave it to my professional members as to whether or not there are violations here that we want to say, yes, they should, if, if, we're, if they're going to be suspended, it should be 30 days or more, absolutely, and not have the ALJ say, oh, well, the person's a nice guy or the violation, I'm, I'm, we're, I'm using my juris, um, discretion to make it less than 30 days. Are there, are there violations here that we as a board want to say, suspension and it has to be 30 days or more well it starts on page 42 of 57 um, you know I, I don't have the professional knowledge to know uh, well enough but for example excesses, excess excessive prescribing um, is that an instance where we want to say yeah if you violate that and suspension is warranted, it has to be at least 30 days. Um, I recall something like fraud is in here someplace, or gross, or, or gross negligence or fraud. Do we want to even give the ALJ discretion to have it less than 30 days? Oh, fraud is on page 46. Um, seems to me if, if there's a finding of fraud, 
I, I don't want the ALJ to come in with anything less than 30 days. So my question related to that is if we do change it to what you're proposing, we would have to then specify because we will not have an opportunity as a board to make a decision on how long that time frame is going to be, correct? Well, we still, the, the, the ALJ would still have the discretion to set the exact amount. The question for, our, for the board on this issue is whether or not there is a minimum amount of suspension that we want to require the ALJs to impose. So I'd like to make a comment. So that would mean we need to go through each of the um, each of the disciplinary things and decide a minimum amount of suspension for each and every one of them, or are we going to just do a blanket thirty day suspension? I, I think the um, Consumer Protection Committee went through and 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 considered, or, or I think staff made it all. Remove the or 30 days or more. I think that was but, at my suggestion. Right, right. Yeah. And then my point was, my thought was, for example, fraud. If an ALJ f finds fraud, to me, you got to be suspended 30 days, at least 30 days. And I guess I would hope that someone looking at that and determining what that suspension was going to be would not say, oh, it's a week. Um, being able to judge accordingly, but then then that question comes up, then we're leaving it in their hands to determine what's a, what's appropriate. So maybe we need to do a little extra work and go through each of these um, uh, infractions and determine what the minimum would be, rather than just saying 30-day suspension blanketly. And I think we have, the board and committee have had um, some of these discussions, I think, back and forth, and that is why you sort of came to the settling on not prescribing here, um, because it really does matter case by case, the individual uh, uh, infractions um, and circumstances. You know, there are some places where it's a matter of a, a CE fraud. Um, and so, of course, we want to make sure that they're, uh, they're uh, uh, Suspension of practice encompasses at least enough time for them to be able to do that next coursework. And so that the suspension of practice is very specific to the infraction and the circumstances. Um, and so I, th I think that there have been a few times the board and the committee have taken a look and I think tried to come down to those sorts of numbers and really, I think, listen to staff and that the specifics of each probationer probationer's case really depends on how long should that person not be practicing in order to fulfill the very minimum of the things that we need them to do to get back to a point where we can allow them to be out treating the public. Um, so let's see now. I'm trying to find the staff report because the staff report was very helpful on this. I'm sorry. I'm Scrolling through here. So uh, the staff report on, this is page one of four on item 10, um, notes um, some areas that are, are, are major league violations. And uh, I don't know if we have time to do that today, but do we want to say for these specific violations that there should be at least 30 days suspension. We don't have to go through all of them, but the ones um, either staff or I noted as the kind of major violations were excessive prescribing, gross negligence, fraud, unlawful solicitation, unlawful referrals, employing cappers or steers, and fraudulently altering medical records. Um, I mean, if we can imagine that we'd be okay with an ALJ saying suspension of less than 30 days is, is, is okay, then we can just go move forward with the, with the entire package. But if any of these violations, we think, yeah, we want an ALJ to say at least 30 days, then we can pull that one out and say 
at least three days. Uh, in the lang le leave in the language it says three days or more. Does that does that make sense to people? I think there can be so many exceptions to that. Yeah, you're you're mentioning those, but say somebody is is uh, convicted of assault. You know, but the, the drugs and alcohol definitely thirty days. Um, holding yourself out to be a specialist when you can't hold yourself out to be a specialist in optometry, that, me, eh, you know, that's not worth 30 days. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, and so if there, there, if there are violations among this set that we want that variability, then let's just go forward and not add the 30 days. Um, the best example to me is, is fraud. If someone's been, conv uh, you know, engages in fraud, that seems like pretty pretty bad, and then we don't want an, an ALJ to come back with less than 30 days. I could be wrong. Well, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they won't. You know, the ALJ is exhibiting their best judgment based on the facts in front of them and the guidance you've provided, but also their general um, experience and expertise with a variety of other cases and applying these roughly these types of terms to many cases. So it might be something where if you start to see issues where you're getting cases back and you're going, whoa, they give them a, you know, a week-long uh, suspension for something fraudulent, you know, and, and uh, also quite often fraudulent cases could end up being more on the side of a full revocation anyway if it's a fraud, if it warrants that, right? So, so it might be something where if you start seeing cases come back that present that kind of a problem that maybe that's the time to fine-tune the guidance you're giving. I don't know, just a suggestion. I don't know. Well, can't we just uh, den uh, reject a proposed decision? Of course. So, when in other words, on us, a... we say, well, that wasn't enough. Exactly. So, in other words, it's a two step thing where, on a case by case basis, you would be able to reject and say, oh, this is, you know, we, ha we have to pull up the transcripts and understand why they would have applied so little and maybe apply more. And then, in the grander scheme, let's say you're saying more than one or two of those, then you say, okay, wait a second. These ALJs clearly need more guidance from us. Let's adjust our guidance, our guidelines. So, I, I'm, I think I'm a little confused. So, when we usually have issues come before us, in, medication, in many cases, the suspension is stayed for probate. Um, no. Pardon me, it okay, might be, so, it might yeah. be that uh, the terms revocation and suspension. So, okay, okay, yes, okay, yeah, okay, the okay. revocation gets stayed in order to apply terms like suspension, which is a good distinction to make. Any other discussion by the board? Any comments by the public? Okay. Now, I'll entertain a motion. Well, you can. The, the motion might be to prove as <clears throat> as um, presented. It could be. Approve as a, uh, presented with the following changes. Um, staff, is there are there dis decisions in here embedded that we need to make? Or it doesn't seem like it. You've kind of laid out, it right? It would just, yeah. it adjusting to be the addition today, um, the use and abuse of drugs and alcohol. But otherwise, I think we're looking for a motion as reported with that edit. And I think a change to term 10 was the only other Change to term 10. Oh, and either and free. Thank you. Yes. So um, I'll make a motion to accept the edits, uh, to accept it as is with the two aforementioned edits. I'll, I'll second that. Can somebody clarify what the two aforementioned edits are? <laughs> there was the one about the community service where we changed. It was a little bit confusing about optometric free not free non optometric or so we just change it to either free non optometric or free optometric services and then the other one was on that char just talked about and so that's um, within the standard the uniform standards related to substance abuse and this would be uh, 1575 clause B in the conduct if the conduct found to be a violation involves the use or abuse of drugs or alcohol Mm -hmm. okay. I'm sorry, do we have a motion? I made the motion. Uh, do I have, second it? All right, second. All right, any further discussion by the board? 
Any comment by the public? All right. Um, Thank you. Take a, a vote. Uh, Dr. Kawaguchi. Aye. Ms. Brandvine, absent. Dr. Turetsky. Aye. Dr. Chala, absent. Ms. Garcia. Aye. Aye. Do Dr. McIntyre, aye. Maria Salazar Sperber, absent. Dr. Wong. Aye. And Ms. Michelin, absent. And Mr. Moradomi. Before I vote, I have a question to counsel. So if I vote no, will this still pass? Oh. Yeah. No. It will. In other words, I think you you five just had five. It would be a five one zero vote, and it would pass. It will still pass. That's true. Okay, then I vote no. You've really, you've expressed some intent there. <laughs> All right. Next item is our update and discussion on possible action of uh, potential twenty twenty legislation. We'll give staff a moment. Do we taking a look here? And our time. Okay. Do we want just just point? Do we want to sure. And let's. Final. Okay. So let's go ahead. We'll take a, a quick bio break um, to return at two twenty p.m.